Welcome, everybody, to this fifth edition of the Banking Supervision Forum. It's very lovely to see so many people in the room. It feels like a big reunion. The title of our conference this year is Europe, Banking on Resilience. I'm Connie Lotze from ETB Communications. As you know, this is the last Banking Supervision Forum under the chairmanship of Andrea Andrea. So this is also a chance to bid him farewell and hear his insights and learnings over the past five years. We hope the forum will offer a good mix of looking back at almost 10 years of European banking supervision, assessing the current state of banking and discussing the challenges that lie ahead. But without any further ado, let me introduce President Lagarde to officially open the conference. President Lagarde. Thank you very much, Connie, and good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon, very specially, to you, Andrea, and, uh, and to all your guests and all your friends. It's amazing to actually see the, uh, the round of those who care for you, who like you very much, and many of those who have worked with you. So it's a pleasure to welcome all of you to the fifth Forum on Banking Supervision. It was 10 years ago, on October 15th, 2013, that the European Council approved the regulation launching the single supervisory mechanism. It was, in my view, the most significant step in European integration since the introduction of the Euro. And there were two reasons for taking it. First reason, it would lead to stricter and more uniform supervision, a single supervisor enforcing a single set of rules for a single banking market. That would in turn make it possible to establish a true banking union with a common safety net. And a banking union would strengthen the monetary union by ensuring that bank deposits were seen as equally safe everywhere. To quote Andrea Enria, as he eloquently put it, only unified supervision and an integrated safety net can make sure that one euro has the same value and is afforded the same protection regardless of the member state in which it is deposited." End of quote. Second, single supervision would help make monetary policy more effective because a weak banking system can complicate our task of stabilizing inflation in both directions. When central banks are easing policy, a fragile financial sector can impede the transmission of lower rates to the economy, especially if banks are unable to lend. And this is what we saw after the euro crisis, when banks were deleveraging as the ECB was cutting rates. But when a central bank tightens policy, weak banks can also interfere with the rate hikes. If monetary policy gives disproportionate weight to financial stability risks, it might tighten less than it ought to. Setting up a single supervisor was a necessary condition to achieve both these goals. But of course, there was no guaranteed success 10 years ago. It had to be tested by time and the turn of events, and it had to be shaped by leadership, notably that of you, Andrea, and indeed your predecessor, Daniel Nui. In my very short remarks today, I will explain how European banking supervision has brought key improvements to the supervisory landscape that we have now, and also to the effectiveness of monetary policy. So, there are many improvements that result from the work that you have done on the supervisory landscape, but I would mention three that really stand out. First, European banking supervision has led to sounder banks, thanks to supervisors enforcing tougher regulatory standards and topping them up when necessary. You might not all agree with that because you might think that those sounder banks have nothing to do with supervision. I would contend that it does. The aggregate common equity tier one ratio of supervised banks stood at 15.7% in 2013. 
in the second quarter of 23, up by 440 basis points since the start of European supervision. Banks benefit from liquidity coverage and net stable funding ratios well above the minimums at 158% for the first and 126% for the latter. And non-performing loans fell from around 1 trillion euros in 2014 to below 340 mil billion at the end of last year. Second, the single supervisor has made supervision more uniform, meaning that supervisory practices are now applied in a consistent basis. For example, single supervision has led to capital add-ons being applied much more consistently across banks. When European supervision began, the correlation between banks' risk profiles and their capital requirements across Europe was just 40%. This meant that for the same risk profile, supervisors in various member states of Europe were applying very different capital requirements. Today, that correlation has risen from 40 to 86%. Third, European supervision has helped us identify common priorities in terms of risk management and address them in a forward-looking basis. Climate risk is a case in point. There is mounting evidence that the costs of delaying are substantially higher than those of a timely transition towards a more sustainable economy. And without a single supervisor, these risks would likely be addressed in an inconsistent way. But thanks to European supervision, banks have been made well aware that failure to take into account the transition would be incompatible with sound risk management. And this is why last year's thematic review required banks to shine a light on climate-related and environmental risks. And it revealed that while banks have made progress, they still have some way to go to properly incorporate these risks into their risk management frameworks. So granted, Banking union, union is not complete, we all know that. But at least we can say that the first pillar, a strong and unified European supervisor, has been achieved and is delivering. So what are the implications of this for our monetary policy? I think we can both say that the last two years, the last few years, I would say, starting with the pandemic, certainly, have tested the interactions between monetary policy and banking supervision in both directions. First, the impact of the pandemic shock required monetary policy to ease significantly in order to prevent a deflationary bust. But unlike in the previous crisis, European supervision was able to leverage the strong position of banks to sustain lending. Supervisors provided capital and operational relief measures to banks. Everybody remembers the ban on dividends. Uh-uh. What really was important at that time was the relief measures that were decided. And this enabled banks, not that the other one is unimportant, huh? but this enabled banks to maximize the funds accessible through the ECB's targeted longer-term refinancing operations to channel credit to the economy. And this joint effort was crucial to keep the economy afloat, especially while fiscal measures were still being rolled out. From March to May 2020, bank lending to companies in the euro area surged by nearly 250 billion, the largest jump we have ever seen in a three months period. Then we faced a sequence of shocks which pushed inflation in exactly the opposite direction. And that led to the fastest monetary policy tightening in the euro area on record. We ended net asset purchases and increased rates by 450 basis points in little over a year. This is indeed sudden reversal. And it could have severely stressed the European banking sector, just as we saw elsewhere in the world. 
Indeed, research suggests that the transition from low to higher rates can negatively affect the banking sector. But European supervisors had worked diligently and had done so over the last few years to help banks realign their business models, which enabled them to face the rate reversal on a much more solid footing. In particular, when the ECB began normalizing its monetary policy at the end of 21, European supervision proactively prepared banks to face the risks arising from the new environment. Supervisors focused on banks' funding strategies and encouraged them to improve their management of interest rate risks. Not everywhere, but here, yes. This included increased scrutiny of risks in banks held to maturity portfolios and disclosure of their unrealized losses, which turned out to be significantly lower than unrealized losses of banks in other places. In this way, European banking supervision has not only empowered our monetary policy response to the pandemic, but also facilitated our fight against inflation by readying banks to the new environment. The conclusion is clear. Single supervision has complemented the single monetary policy, just as theory predicted it would. It was Alexander Pope, the 18th century English poet, who said, Blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. <laughs> but a decade ago, as we emerged from the euro crisis, we did not have that luxury. We launched European banking supervision with high expectations, not only for it to be a strong supervisor, but an essential piece of a complete monetary union. And it has not disappointed. In fact, faced with severe tests that we could never have imagined at the time, it has exceeded most reasonable expectations. We have a strong banking sector in Europe. It has transformed from a shock propagator into a shock absorber. And under European supervision, banks are now more alert to new risks that may lie around the corner. Is it perfect? No, but much stronger. So, Andrea, and everyone at European Banking Supervision, you can look back at a job well done. And I have great confidence that success will continue in the future. And I want to personally thank you for the great cooperation that we've had over the last four years. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Lagarde. Let me now introduce our first segment, which is a conversation between two eminent persons, who you of course all know, in the field of European and global finance. May I ask, please, Supervisory Board Chair Andrea Enria and Jacques Delarosier on stage. Jacques Delarosier, former IMF Managing Director, Governor of the Banque de France, and President of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Please come to the stage and take your seats. Very low seats. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon to all of you. Good afternoon, Jacques. Thanks for being with uh, with us today. Uh, that's a real treat for me. Your presence. Uh, you know, when uh, during these years, uh, when when looking at the challenges I was facing, uh, I was always always trying to find some uh, inspiration. And I always had basically three uh, masters in my Olymp personal Olympus I was looking at. And, uh, and they were, and they still are, uh, Alexandre Lanfalusi, Tommaso Palaschiop, and Jacques de la Rosière. I mean, they have been always uh, the persons I've been looked at to, you know, to their writings when I needed inspiration 
in front of different uh, difficult choices. And, uh, and Jacques has been, of course, when, uh, when the EBA was established, uh, it, it, we started the dialogue and the friendship that I, is one of the, of, the, of the things that guided me throughout this, uh, this period. So thank you very much, Jacques, for being here with us today. That's really a, 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 a big gift for me. So, and I'm sure it will be the, the highlight of our event uh, in these days. So let, let me start uh, with a question. You, with your group, were at the forefront no, of shaping the response of the European Union uh, to the great financial crisis and to the sovereign debt crisis afterwards in terms of uh, regulatory and supervisory framework. Um, do you think that you, the reforms introduced uh, in Europe at that time are enough, or do you think that uh, the turmoil that we have experienced with the, the shift, the rapid shift in, uh, in the interest rate environment recently require additional adjustments and uh, maybe to rethink part of the, of the work that we have done? Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much, Andrea. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be with you this evening. I'm all the more delighted that um, you have chosen me to preside over this first conversation. And um, I want to say on the record that um, I have an enormous amount of uh, esteem and admiration for you for three or four reasons. The first one, is that you are extremely competent and hardworking in your field. The second one is that you have a vision. You don't just look at the immediate uh, hurdles. You have a vision. The third thing is that you have a will, a European will, which is something rather scarce at this time. And... Um, for those three reasons, you have enormously impressed me. And the fact that you have asked me to chat with you today is a sign of this mutual friendship. So to answer your question, is it enough what you have done on the regulatory side in order to protect the banks against the shocks? I think it is true that uh, the recent interest rate uh, hikes, hikes are having a serious impact on the profitability of commercial banks. Even if the Basel regulations address most of the risks, we must not conceal the fact that headwinds are threatening. They are threatening because the application of these prudential rules is far from universal. The IRRBB, Quantitative Framework to Support Continuous Supervisory Assessment of Interest Rate Risk in the Banking Book, covers the current and prospective risks to earnings and capital coming from adverse movements in interest rates, affecting assets which are not marked to market. But this fundamental part of regulation is not universally applied. This is what you alluded to, Madame Lagarde, a moment ago. The result is that bank holding a large proportion of their long-term positions at low interest rates are particularly vulnerable unless they have internal models for managing and hedging those risks. Unlike Europe, the United States did not adequately incorporate the risk of rising interest rates into its supervisory mechanism. Inexplicably, at least for me, one of the only elements not included in US stress tests were the rise in interest rates. 
and I haven't yet understood how it could happen. Moreover, in the US, banks with total assets up to $700 billion are still allowed not to deduct from capital unrealized losses of such portfolios. This freedom in the United States is questionable. The recent Basel Endgame proposal reduces this flexibility to banks below $100 billion total assets. It's not yet in force, but it's, it's the idea. And uh, that would leave many regional and community banks unprepared for potential liquidity stress. All in all, the IMF has calculated under its, quote, global stress test, unquote, a significant deterioration of common equity ratios over the last months. When enterprises start being affected by higher interest rates for longer, inevitably the quality of credit will deteriorate and non-performing loans will tend to rise. According to the IMF baseline scenario, 215 banks holding 42% of assets would prove weak. Given the importance of weak tail banks, especially mid-sized banks, and a possible contagion to stronger banks, it would seem appropriate to take into account the possible capital losses of such banks in an IMF-type stagflationary scenario. This would lead to a somewhat more demanding regulatory framework and to a more extensive use of market fair value. These vulnerabilities depend very much on the business models of individual banks and on the stickiness or instability of their depositors. Supervisors cannot, of course, detect at all moments the combination of such numerous factors, but they should, in my view, see to it that they stay alert and are prepared to address at all times the remaining weaknesses of the banking system. So that's how I would, ask, would answer your first question, my dear friend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jacques. And, and indeed, I must say that uh, I don't know whether I managed to pass this uh, consideration uh, enough to my team here, but uh, one of the learnings of the last period is that, uh, uh, you know, the use of market valuations in supervision, I mean, usually we don't do that. No, we, we, tend to, we tend to look at balance sheet indicators, but when things get rough, generally uh, markets start looking at banks on a mark-to-market on a, on a, on a -mark basis. And, uh, and this can create very, very rapid, uh, you know, uh, vicious circles, no? In terms of, in terms of uh, uh, valuations going down, equity prices going down, and then these triggering uh, outflows of deposits. We have seen this very much during the spring turmoil. And, uh, and I think that we as supervisors need to think how to incorporate better also market valuations, market perspectives uh, in, in our day-to-day -day supervision. So that's a very good point that I take also from your from your answer. Um, another point on which we have discussed a lot in the past, and you, you helped me thinking and shaping my thinking on that, but uh, the reality has not moved accordingly, uh, is the point of integration in our, in our market. Uh, we, 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 have, we have seen a lot of progress in the banking union, in realizing the banking union, but we have not seen a lot of progress in uh, uh, moving towards a generally integrated uh, banking market. Markets are still very much segmented along national lines and uh, uh, no major progress, I must say, has been done uh, during the last, uh, the last years. Uh, what are, in your view, the causes and the implications of this fragmentation? 
Well, first of all, before I answer your question, I would like to say that uh, I was very happy and proud that you took over the first uh, chairmanship of EBA, which is a, a child of the, the, the group that I had the honor to chair uh, put, put forward. This group did not have the majority needed to move in the direction of a single supervisory mechanism, which eventually was uh, decided a few years after. And uh, I would like here to pay tribute to this unification and to the, to the SSM. Now, to answer your question about banking fragmentation in Europe and the fact that uh, the home host conflicts have not been resolved, uh, I would like to remind ourselves that uh, the initial objective of, uh, of a banking union was to eliminate the sovereign bank loop. Uh, banks were too much involved in financing governments and uh, that uh, led them to supplementary weakness and uh, because the, the weakness of the state that had to borrow so much was percolating into the banks that were financing those states. So the idea was to reduce this uh, sort of structural weakness. And um, if I look at the situation, uh, I don't think we have achieved this uh, objective. And we haven't achieved it not because of the banks, but because of the fiscal slippage, uh, which has happened in a number of countries because the budgetary deficits are forcing banks to contribute to finance these deficits. So this sovereign doom loop could even increase in the coming months uh, with quantitative tightening. Secondly, the bad memories, quote unquote, of the 2007-2008 crisis, particularly in countries like Belgium and Luxembourg, are still vivid. Authorities in host countries are requesting that uh, subsidiaries of large bank groups in their local economies have sufficient capital and liquidity in place locally to cope with crises affecting these groups. So this basically is a problem of confidence. And in my view, the essential cause of the compartmentalization that you are denouncing rightly. Now, I am not sure that branching is a realistic solution to this fragmentation problem, especially for retail banks as neither the member states nor the banks themselves seem to be eager to, to do it. And uh, if that is the case, if large groups are not that interested in, uh, in getting complete fluidity capital-wise in, in the in their locations and implementations locally, then the question is, are we right to insist so much on our side to, to get this done? It's a question. Now, in my opinion, the creation of a European Deposit Insurance Scheme, the EDIS, would help to solve the problem. But uh, I'm not sure that it would be enough. And uh, what I see is that large banks are not very eager to have an agreement on the EDs because 
it costs them a lot of money in terms of contributions. And they are entitled to ask themselves, is it worth putting so much money in uh, a universal uh, system of guaranteeing deposits when we know, it's the bank, who's, the bank who say that, when we know that uh, our financial credibility is bigger than that of smaller banks, and in a way we have to pay, i.e. reduce our profitability for the sake of banks that, in spite of your presence, are perhaps not as uh, securely uh, supervised as they they ought to be. So uh, I, I'm sorry not to respond in perhaps the 100% positive way that you might have expected <laughs> from me, but uh, I don't think you can make a banking union against part of the banks, a large part of the banks. And when I say the large part of banks, I don't only think of the large groups. I also think of uh, mutual banks. Uh, I think of the German situation, which are, these banks are wishing to maintain their international, international protection schemes, the famous IPS. So, should we go against those, uh, those views and those interests? Uh, I'm, I'm asking the question. Only the determination of the, of the largest countries in the Union based itself on uh, better economic convergence and therefore a return of confidence only that determination of large countries coupled with the will of uh, uh, most banks in these countries would su succeed in resolving the current impasse on the issue of banking union. I'm sorry to have been a bit, a bit nuanced, a bit negative on some on some accounts, but uh, I think the banking union is more the reflection of our European inability to advance on large projects in a mutually politically acceptable environment than a purely technical question, which is, are we Shouldn't we go through branches and things like that? I think it's more profound, and um, I would, of course, hope that uh, this sort of move in favor of this movement uh, by large countries would appear. But for the time being, it is not there. And therefore, uh, I have to... I, I, I have to nuance my answer. Mm. I have to refrain from uh, taking up some of the points, but I cannot totally. <laughs> so, um, I mean, first of all, let's say I, I see your points, uh, uh, and they reflect a lot of the reality that we are confronted with right now. Uh, uh, but I tend to believe, first of all, if I look at what, uh, for instance, the um, the U.S. banks or the uh, or the Swiss banks that have uh, uh, recently you know, uh, uh, moved their business to the uh, to the euro area after Brexit, no, uh, most of these banks have adopted exactly a branching structure. So they have uh, integrated all their subsidiaries into the parent company, and they are now branching out throughout uh, the single market. So the paradox is that uh, the uh, the non-European groups are exploiting the single market to the, to the most, 
and the European banks are not. What is the difference? You, you touched an important point. The difference is deposits, let's be honest. When I talk to the bankers, they tell me, you know, if you go in a country, you are, do deposit taking, it's more difficult to do that without having a sort of, you know, uh, you, you are touching more delicate issues, and if they perceive that the local authorities are not uh, supporting this, uh, this branchification, they, they would not be uh, pushing that argument. But I also think that uh, you know, uh, there is something at this juncture which is dependent on the, on the market environment. With, uh, with the current uh, uh, valuations, depressed valuations of our banks, of course, uh, banks have been all focused in pumping up their, their profitability, uh, increasing the remuneration to shareholders. They have not really invested in developing their franchise. I hope, I still have the hope, and don't kill this hope, please, that uh, uh, tomorrow, you know, uh, uh, when, you know, there will be a more, you know, uh, stable profitability, uh, and banks will start asking themselves how to invest in their future, how to develop their franchise. I mean, having a larger domestic market of 500 million uh, savers, I mean, could be something more attractive than developing, you know, little shops in different, uh, in different member states. I think there could be value for their own uh, business in doing exactly that. But again, I mean, I agree with you. And by the way, on the issue of the uh, cooperative savings banks, and especially the, the German Sparkassen, I've never understood why you can, I mean, I've never seen any proposal coming from our colleagues in Brussels uh, that has uh, proposed a dismantlement of the institutional protection schemes of cooperative and savings banks. I mean, we are always very supportive of these schemes. They can very well survive in a, in a complete banking union. But I you know, I mean, but the point that you raise are relevant. I mean, these are the political sensitivities that still uh, put sense in the wheel of, uh, of the process. Um, yeah, may I just say that what you have just stated a few minutes ago is absolutely perfect. I mean, intellectually and uh, action-oriented, it's, it's perfect. I agree fully. But the reality today is that it's very difficult to launch this thing without more support from the big players. I understand that. I understand that. that. So, um, okay. Uh, now moving on. Um, one of the important points that were actually in your report, in the report of your group, no, um, back uh, in when was it, 2010, if I remember well, um, was the creation of an integrated microprudential supervision and of a European macroprudential. Uh, supervision, macroprudential policy. Um, do you think that we have the right framework right now for addressing systemic risk at the, in, the, in the banking union, the, in the European markets, and uh, for smooth interaction between the microprudential and the macroprudential dimensions? Yes, this is a point that, um, that touches my heart, because when we issued the report in the early months of 2009 on the improvement of uh, the regulatory and the supervisory system for banks in Europe. We touched on macro uh, prudential uh, risks and w ways to, to cope with them. It was one of the legacies of uh, L'Enfant Lucie, who had developed, I think, amongst the first, the importance of macroprudential actions. And we, we made a proposal in this report, which was to create a, a body called the ESRB, uh, which was a, a body within the ECB that was supposed to alert uh, countries, authorities, uh, public on uh, the macroeconomic risks that were looming. And I must say that uh, 
this construction that we proposed and which was adopted eventually by the Council and the Commission and the Parliament have, uh, have not lived up to our expectations. Uh, I have stressed this many times uh, in front of the Commission which uh, asked me to elaborate a bit further on this uh, uh, ESRB system. In my opinion, with hindsight now, I, I think the, the Macro Prudential Council would have been more effective if it had been separate from the ECB. I'm sorry to say that in this August uh, uh, building, but uh, I think if it had been separated from the ECB, and if it had had a broader composition with uh, practitioners, uh, theoretical people, but also technicians, academics, uh, it would have shown perhaps more uh, accuracy in its, uh, in its uh, feelings and uh, more independence. Because, to say the truth, the big crisis that have happened since the uh, creation of that body have uh, neither been predicted nor even felt or sensed by that uh, council. And I think that that uh, inefficiency, to say the least, should be sanctioned by a change in in the body. Now, I'm sorry for the bluntness of my remarks, but it's only a repetition of what I have already said over the last years. Finally, you have not asked me that question, but I'm, I'm going to raise it. Um, <laughs> the, de the development of uh, what we call non-banks in recent years should continue uh, to concern us. Uh, the role in financing the European economy has doubled since 2008. Doubled. So it's not uh, a sympathetic little problem that we have on our minds and we just think of something else just afterwards. It's something that is <laughs> fundamental. It's uh, it's, it's half the financing of uh, what the banks finance in, in Europe, which is enormous, because the markets are much less potent in Europe than they are in the United States. So if you, if you look at it statistically, the non-bank uh, intrusion in our economy is much higher than it is in a country like the United States. And still, nothing happens much bit our regulations, but not it's not regulated like the banking system. And um, I think that uh, the repercussions of possible defaults uh, would affect, of course, the banks, which are the main creditors of those non-banking institutions. And therefore, if it was only for the contagious a problem, I would be anxious. But it's much more than the contagious problem because uh, their deficiencies or failures could, could have uh, very serious repercussions on the, the non-banking sectors also. So I think it's a problem uh, since we have the privilege of talking freely today. I think it's something that your successors and Madame Lagarde should look at because it's, uh, it's um, I have been uh, accustomed since 2007-2008 to say A, it's very important, B, we're going to work on it and C, nothing happens. So, I'll say it again. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Jacques. Uh, I think our time is, uh, is, uh, is over. I don't think that, uh, that we can, uh, that we can uh, uh, say, anybody can say that we uh, invite you here to flatter us with, uh, <laughs> with compliments, uh, of course, uh, but I think that your, your critical, your critical uh, remarks and your also knowledge of uh, the real obstacles that we are confronted with and the challenges we are confronted with is something that uh, keeps us on our toes and uh, reminds us of the difficult challenges we have. Also, this issue of non-bank financial institutions is something that uh, you know the ECB has been raising for a long while. It's a, it's a big challenge, and uh, of course, we uh, the uh, in the banking supervision side have tried to you know do our best to make sure that what is the interface between the banks and bank financial institutions uh, is well uh, safeguarded, well overseen. Uh, but that indeed is a is a challenge, and you're right in uh, reminding us that uh, you know. Uh, uh, alerts have been raised uh, since a long while, and unfortunately, the willingness to move forward with uh, greater ambition in terms of deploying regulation and supervision in this sector has not uh, succeeded. Anyway, thank you very much, Jacques, for your time with us, for your wisdom, and for your continued sharpness and contribution to our debate. I, I really enjoyed the conversation, and I'm sure all our uh, audience here did as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're back, and uh, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, uh, for the great conversation. I'm sure um, it seemed like the whole room was on tenter hooks to listen to you. So, uh, w and that is very much leads us to our first panel discussion here. They are all set up, and the panel is called "Taking Stock: The Single Supervisor Ten Years On." Let me introduce our moderator, Nicolas Veron, who is a senior fellow at Bruegel and the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Nicolas will introduce the panel members, so please go ahead, Nicolas. Thanks, Connie, and um, wow, that's a tough act to follow. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, Andrea, um, here we're 10 years on. I remember we were uh, on uh, the same panel five years on, five years ago in early December um, 2018. That was a farewell uh, event for Daniel Nui, uh, who was also a tough act to follow. Uh, and um, I was looking at my notes of that event uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, I uh, had 
came out or into the panel, I don't remember, with four challenges for European banking supervision. Um, this was my reading. Uh, the bank sovereign vicious circle, still there, we heard it. Um, the risk of political rejection of European banking supervision, because there was a risk of a good cop, bad cop dynamic in which the NCAs, the national competent authorities, would be the good cops and your shop would be the bad cops. I think the uh, picture on this five years on, uh, again, my personal judgment here, uh, is actually quite positive. This scenario has not really materialized. Maybe it will materialize in the future, but, uh, but uh, it has not so far. Third one is the internal workings and governance of the supervisory board. Here, I have to say, I don't know because it's not public information, uh, but seen from the outside, no dysfunction has been uh, really observable. Uh, and the fourth one was uh, less significant institutions and the risk of regulatory arbitrage between the tougher standards for larger banks and the uh, laxer standards pot potentially based on anecdotal evidence uh, for smaller banks. I think here my impression is that um, the practice of the last five years under your leadership have brought some improvement. But it's not for me to provide assessments here. It's for our panelists. Um, I will uh, start by asking them short questions. They will probably not answer directly my questions, and they will say what they want to say, but, uh, I, um, which is appropriate. Uh, but I uh, call them on uh, time discipline. We want this to be a conversation. So um, maybe starting with you, Elizabeth. For you, so uh, President Lagarde has told us, in her judgment, the uh, uh, European supervision uh, has exceeded expectations. Uh, what have been the most important achievements of the last five years? It's awfully hard to uh, brag about oneself, so this is not at all about me. I say that at the start. It's really about Andre and his leadership and all of the staff at the ECB and all of the, the board. And I think there are significant achievements, and there are three. The first is, um, Resilience. We have a very resilient banking system. It, it, it entered this period of time and it withstood this period of time, which has been a triple threat. The pandemic, the war, and also rising interest rates. And that is no small feat. The second is maybe an intangible that's worth its weight in gold, and that is um, trust. And I would say that word in connection with the internal workings of the supervisory board and also structural changes and a much more collaborative spirit that we saw develop uh, across the teams and the staff. And that trust um, is something really immeasurable. You know, when you think about the start of the banking union, there were a myriad of supervisory philosophies and practices and the way forward which Danielle Nui did so ably, was to set up rules and consistency and processes. And that enabled then for trust to be developed where the board doesn't have to revert back all the time just to the rules, but to take judgment calls and to allow the staff to take judgment calls. And then that's the third element. And I would say it's agility. I think um, Andrea said rather famously that the SSM is a tanker camouflaged as a race car. <laughs> Did I say it the wrong way? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> a it's race a, it's, car. It's, it's a tanker camouflaged as a race car. It's camouflaged as a tanker camouflaged as a race car. <laughs> you get the point. But I think um, it, this is also something that you, know, you don't see and you don't measure it. But having the ability to have agile risk-based supervision is what's absolutely needed in this incredibly challenging time that we're in with the triple threat and with the changes in the economy. And that's the day-to-day -day supervisory process. I think those are three very tangible achievements. Dominique, um, you've been in the uh, supervisory board. You're now a supervisor yourself because the SRB has a backup supervisory function. Uh, so you have multiple hats to wear on this panel. Uh, how do you look at it? And, uh, and, and also, frankly, how has the SRB's role uh, how has the SRB found its role in the broader supervisory framework? Thank you. Thank you, Nicola, for this question. Well, I, 
I was um, a, a little bit uh, surprised that during the first interventions, never ever the term resolution or second pillar of the banking union were mentioned. So thank you for inviting me to, let's say, put flesh on this notion about a, this, uh, this second pillar. And indeed, indeed, what, what matters when, when you, you spoke about trust, when you spoke about resilience, indeed there is a continuity between these two pillars of the banking union. I think we, uh, 10 years ago there was nothing in terms of, of resolution. But, but don't forget the value added of building this additional element for, let's say, pre preventing supervision and managing the crisis when they occur. This participates in, in building this additional level of trust and this additional level of resilience. I'm absolutely persuaded of that. So that means that, uh, yes, indeed, there is a sort of continuum between supervision and uh, resolution, because in our jargon, we are speaking about resolvability, meaning that if we want to step in uh, properly based on the outcome of the work conducted by the supervisors, we need to be ready. And when I say we, it means the supervisors, the resolution authorities, the bankers themselves, and obviously all the others uh, uh, who are involved in a crisis management. Because managing a crisis means a lot, a lot of actors and a lot, a lot of interconnection. And the best thing to do is to prepare this in good times, in peaceful times. So yes, we have some sort of supervisory role when, when we are working about resolvability. We are working in reality hands in hands with our colleagues here at the ECB, also with the, the national authorities of Obviously, and we are building more and more this uh, resolvability step by step. So that means that we need to work during going concern period to avoid to have to, to act during gone concern situations. But if we have to act, we will do, obviously. Let me give you three very, very, very tiny examples of this daily cooperation between supervision and resolution. And Andrea, you, you have a big role to play here. We have decided this year to visit all together the banking union member states. So we are organizing common visits, and I'm very pleased that, Claudia, you've accepted to, to continue this, uh, this good practice, showing what the banking union means in reality. Uh, second example, we've developed, and I know that bankers are always complaining about that, we are developing common templates, common approaches to avoid overlaps or to avoid to give a feeling that we are doing completely separated things. We are building something which is in a continuum. And the third, third example, they well commented, by the way, in due time, it was this famous a, a common joint statement we, we took in, in March about the treatment of 81s. And uh, thank you, Jose Manuel, from EBA, to, 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 to be also part of this, uh, of this uh, joint statement. Three examples from their different angles, which uh, tell us that, a, indeed, a, we are participating into uh, this supervisory role at our place, and that we are participating in building more trust and resilience in the banking system. We are shift towards more uh, resolvability. We will increase this, uh, this dimension, definitely. Thank you. Anna, uh, we heard uh, Jacques Delarosier give us an incredibly candid and I think accurate uh, exposition of the political economy of banking union uh, at this point and, uh, and, and the fact that large banks um, are not eager for European deposit insurance and not eager on banking union more generally. Is that true of all large banks? Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be the only banker on this panel. <laughs> I will do my best to represent my colleagues. <laughs> and if you allow me to say first that bankers don't complain. <laughs> bankers provide constructive challenge. Absolutely. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'll remember sorry. that. I'll remember that. <laughs> Please. Uh, we are all in this together. OK? And uh, we have some experience at Santander. We actually were the first bank to, um, to test the single resolution. Absolutely. And I believe it worked pretty well. And if you ask me what is the one thing uh, well, actually, several things. One is that you need anticipation, and I think the, the supervisory uh, system is essential on that to know where the weaker links could be. And, um, but very important, you need trust. Uh, as you very well said, you need trust among supervisors. We work with our supervisor at the time. Um, both uh, Bank of Spain had a very important role, and already the SSM, uh, 
but many other actors. It was even the Americans, by the way, because there was a bank in the US. And so it was, it was, it's a complex thing, and I'm very happy that we continue to work on that. But uh, to uh, Jacques Delarosier, Rosier, Monsieur, great admiration for, for you, but banks would love to do more pan-European consolidation. And um, if you allow me, let me just give you how we see it from the boardroom, because you know, we as banks, and Madame Lagarde said it, that, you know, the way the market is valuing banks in Europe still, the cost of equity of Santander today, and we're one of the largest banks with a 15% ROTE, is 18%. And so when we look at uh, pan-European consolidation in, in the board, we are allocating capital. That is the basic decision we're making. We're putting capital at work in certain markets for a certain transaction. So, you know, there are many levels, of course, complexity, teams, and all these other issues. But I'd say three main points we look at. The first is the macro. Are we going to grow in an area that grows? What are the prospects? What are the returns associated with that? And um, there was a very interesting Bruegel study this morning, actually, where uh, productivity per capita in Europe has done better than the US. But the fact is that for just comparing two big markets, the US economy, since the financial crisis, has grown almost double Europe. This is a big factor in terms of where we put our capital and our priorities and our management time. Um, Again, I think Europe has huge opportunities, but the fact is that the prospects for growth remain not as good as in other markets. The second one is, is the operating context, and Andrea mentioned that very well. So the operating context in Europe, and we have launched a digital bank in Germany. We, it's really difficult because the fiscal treatment, there's so many different ring fence. It's liquidity, yes. We don't have a euro. We have a Euro in Germany, a Euro in Spain, a Euro in Italy. That is absolutely essential, but there's many other drawbacks that make this cross-border very, very complex. And so, um, you know, I could go on with the list. Um, I don't want to leave out an essential one, which we cannot have integration in banks if we don't have a single banking union, European deposit insurance, you know, Santander pays 240, 230 million per year we already contribute to a pan-European and a national system. We're not against that. That's one of many other things we have to put in place so that this happens. Let me end by two that you might expect, I would say, in this forum, which is regulatory and supervisory um, items. But they're not the biggest ones. I think the other ones are actually more important. <coughs> uh, in terms of regulation, and this is something which makes sense, you know, the, the more likely candidates for cross-border are going to be the larger banks. If you acquire a bank that is, say, Santander has one trillion in loans, 200 billion immediately would put us into the next GCF charge. Mm -hmm. So anytime, let's assume the macro works, the operating context, we have capital markets, bank, every, but current regulation would make it prohibitively expensive because we would actually become 1% more capital for the whole balance sheet. Um, I, um, on the supervisory front, we, we did Banco Popular. We got great support from, uh, from supervisors, in, uh, both in, in Frankfurt and in Spain. But there are items that have put us at a disadvantage, because there is a process, for example, for approving models. When you take over a failing bank, let me say, usually it's not a greatly managed bank. And so the models in that bank are probably not great. And so it takes time. and until you can go through the process. I know these things we've shared and will be fixed, but I'm just saying that when you actually are there, you are gonna apply the mortgage models of a failed bank potentially, or at least they, there's always issues that arise that are new. And so I'm very happy that there's this collaboration because these are things that would help. But let me say this is not a big point. So Andrea, I mean, this is not the showstopper because you've been very, uh, and your team. We've had many discussions. This is known. So again, this is mostly about capital allocation and where do you put, you know, the world is competing for savings. We need savings. We need equity. Where do you put that? If you go through the list and you're sitting in a board, it's going to be difficult that this happens anytime soon. But we would love that we can together solve all of this, of course. I'll have follow-up questions, but let's move to uh, Sean. Um, you were present at the creation of uh, European banking supervision. 
Uh, you also published a report this year, a DG FISMA report on, uh, on supervision. So how do you look at it? How do I see the baby? Um, well, for well, me, it's, a, it's a teenager now. Yeah, that's the thing. Well, it, it once was a baby. And for me, it's a, an un ambiguous success story. I mean, I think, and although President Lagarde said there were high expectations, success was not guaranteed at the outset. We had high expectations, but we were not entirely sure it would work. And I remember talking to Andrea, actually, and saying that, um, asking him what was the difference between single supervisor and single supervision. And this was before you were ever anywhere around the SSM, and you told me probably about 10 years. So here we are. <laughs> we had a single supervisor, and I think that was done by a legal act. Of Very well drafted. Well crafted, if I may say. And single, thank you. And uh, single supervision, however, is 10 years of hard grind. 10 years, I think, started by Danielle when this was a startup operation. And then I think five more years under Andrea when I think the institution has matured into what is, I think, a, one of the most globally respected supervisors. I think that that's obviously clear. Now, we, are, um, we have done our report. We do a report every three years or so. Um, I will not go into the details of that report, just to say that it came out pretty well for the SSM, I think. Uh, and this is not our report, it's not the Commission sort of, this is what we do checking with the other stakeholders, all the stakeholders of the SSM. And what we found was that the SSM is very well um, regarded by all of its stakeholders. So by the banking sector, by NCAs, within the euro area, so within the banking union, and NCAs outside. So this is, uh, so it's not us saying this, this is the main stakeholders. And we, of course, in the commission, were very proud of whatever part we, pay, we played in bringing this about. And I think with the SSM and the SRB, Dominique, I will never forget you, you know that. Um, we have, I think, you know, put in place a lot of the institutional architecture that we need for the banking union. But as Andrea pointed out earlier, the only thing missing is the, um, is the banking union and the, and the integrated banking sector, which we lost, actually, um, during, during the crisis. And I think for that, I mean, that will require building of more trust, I think, in the ability of the infrastructure to, de to deliver efficient and fair outcomes. And part of that trust will be delivered by um, putting in place the deposit insurance scheme. I'm a commission official. You'd be very disappointed if I didn't mention that, but I happen to believe it's still true. But then also, of course, you have to build trust through, not just through the institutions themselves, but all of the actors, including the commission, the member states in this banking integration process. I can't remember ever disagreeing with Jacques Rosier in my life, and I'm not going to disagree with him now in terms of his factual presentation of the political economy of European financial integration in general and banking in particular. But I'm a commission official and I'm paid to be optimistic and I'm going to stay optimistic. <laughs> because I think one of the unseen things of the crisis apart from the collapse of trust was that the focus of the debate now is almost uniquely on the cost of what goes wrong in cross-border finance and almost none on the benefits of cross-border finance, which is what happens most of the time. And for those of us old enough to have uh, been around before the great financial crisis, you know, we used to talk about scope, scale, economies, diversity, private risk sharing, competition, all those things. I mean, I come from a country which can demonstrate both the upside of cross-border finance and the downside of cross-border finance if you don't manage it properly. But I can tell you, Ireland would not have gone from being the poorest country in the Union to being, on some metrics, the richest country in Europe if it had had to rely on its own savings rate and its own financial system. And I often think that some of the member states who are most sceptical about banking integration, and, and we know the non-linearities in banking integration, mm -hmm. these are the countries who have most to benefit by having it. So, Jacques, I remain optimistic, even though you probably think I'm crazy, but there you are. Thorsten, um, in a way, you provide a view from the Ivory Tower here. Uh, you're uh, one of the most uh, uh, prolific and respected academics in this field. What, 
what is your uh, perspective on what has been achieved in the last 10 years, including the last five years? Thank you. Well, well thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Um, well, first of all, if you look back 15 years, so 2008-9, when the first of us academics no, no, called for what is now referred to the banking union, we were kind of <coughs> laughed out of the room, effectively. We were told it's legally not feasible and it's politically impossible. Okay. Here we are with a single supervisory mechanism 10 years uh, um, 15 years later, and for 10 years in place. So number two, I remember fall 2014, I was back in, based in London back then, and uh, I was invited to a presentation by ECB officials on the comprehensive assessment, which uh, showed there was a result and there was a question. For me, there was a question. The result was this enormous variation in asset quality, asset quality adjustment, but also um, effects of the stress tests. Uh, this is kind of the 40% that Madame Lagarde uh, referred to earlier, uh, which I think, this, as you mentioned, has been closed. The question for all of us back then was, well, what next? So we had these stress tests, and the single supervisory mechanism was about to start. What would be the effect? And I would say, yes, it has been enormously successful. And if I kind of just look at from the literature, so it's a bit hard to summarize the literature in two minutes, but I tried anyway. Um, I think the most important change has been that banks react to the existence of a single supervisor. They also react, by the way, to the stress test. I mean, even the uh, comprehensive assessment, uh, most of the banks that were shown to have a capital shortfall actually raised the capital even before the results were published, which shows us something. Um, so yes, banks that, were under the super, that came under the supervision of the single supervisor uh, raised more capital, lowered their risks. They also did less lending. That's also in there. Um, now, this is the positive side. This is the stability side. Now, I, to just pour a little bit of uh, water into the wine, uh, if you look at the real sector, yes, there has been also, of course, less funding for some firms. On the one hand, for riskier firms, but also in some of the research that I've been doing, we found actually also there's less funding available for intangible assets. Why? Because tighter lending standards, more asking for collateral. Now, is that something negative? I would say no, because maybe we need these other financial intermediaries, the other financial markets, to fund exactly this kind of activities, more the intangible side. So maybe that's also in the sense of this uh, whole uh, debate on bank bias or being overbanked is actually a positive effect. And of course, that brings me just to uh, uh, throw in this buzzword uh, to the capital market union, which I think uh, should, we should also put on the, uh, on the table. So overall, yes, um, my view would be very positive. Now, you did not invite the academic to just stay, do, say positive things, right? You ha I have to do some skeptical things. So, uh, of course, I agree with everybody here on the, on the panel. Uh, I think it was everybody. Um, that the, the banking union, as we understand it, is not sufficient. So I will not repeat it. I will just look at it from the other side. So in normal times, we have a very strong supervisor, which has achieved a lot. And I think the fact that we got through the term oil of spring 2023 actually uh, um, is a big um, merit for Andrea and his team, I would argue, and for the work that has been done by the single supervisor, su supervisor and the su single supervision over the past 10 years. But the question that I ask myself is, what if? If we are in a crisis back in 2008, like in a crisis in 2011, 12, 13, would the SSM be enough? Could we just rely on the SSM? Of course, we have the SRB, but with limited tools and, intent, uh, tools and, uh, and, uh, and policy. Would it be enough, or do we need another ad hoc, uh, uh, ad hoc uh, uh, policy package? And of course, again, this is something that also Nicola and I, we, we, we wrote about. I mean, if you look at the initial three uh, objectives, um, breaking the sovereign bank um, uh, vicious cycle, uh, terminating, uh, finishing off um, bailout forever, and creating a single market in banking, I think we've made limited uh, uh, progress, uh, on, uh, on, unfortunately, in this. So yes, SSM has created a level playing field, but it's not sufficient for really creating a single supervisory mechanism for which we would need the other elements. But, and here I make sure I also agree with uh, Anna Bottin, even that, even if we are waking up one day and we have the banking union complete, would that be sufficient for a single market in banking? No. And you mentioned, of course, taxation. You can think about other regulatory policy. But let me bring up, and this is my final remark, one more thing, the politics. I think as long as we don't get politics, especially local politics, talking about savings banks, local politics, national politics, out of banking, I think we will not be able to get to single market in banking. Now, I'm 
not being paid to be an optimist, uh, unlike uh, Sean. But actually, I'm also a little bit optimistic. Maybe it's, I'm not sure why. But um, uh, we've managed in Europe to get politics out of many, national politics, out of many sectors. So maybe it's now, there is still a chance we can ultimately also get it out of the, out of the banking sector. Thank you. I think getting politics out of saving banks may be a little bit too high a bar, but uh, maybe we can uh, achieve a lot uh, even without that. Uh, the speakers have been uh, commendably disciplined in their uh, time allocation. So, uh, and uh, as a moderator, this is my only role really. So, uh, uh, I, what I will ask them is to uh, answer maybe a very brief uh, follow-up questions uh, from me, and then we open it to the floor. We also open it to the online audience. Uh, there is a tool to ask questions online. Uh, I get them on this uh, ECB device. Uh, and, um, and so I encourage uh, everybody to think of questions. And uh, after the uh, fast round, hopefully, uh, that uh, I'm uh, starting now in the same order. Uh, Elizabeth, um, all the talk right now is about a less capital-driven uh, supervisory review and evaluation process, that it was a bit like, you know, uh, uh, mechanistic or I don't know what the right word is, you will tell us. Uh, there was a high-level report, very interesting, uh, delivered to the uh, European Central Bank earlier this year. I guess, is there a risk of the pendulum going to far back in the wrong direction. So uh, Daniel Nui was all about harmonizing uh, the uh, process and making sure that uh, the uh, ECB was not only tough but also fair. Uh, is there a risk that the uh, move away from capital-centric threat, sorry for talking the jargon, um, would uh, lead us to a situation where actually we could get again into situations of banks in different countries with different politics, with different <coughs> environments being treated differently by European banking supervision. Let me take just a little bit of a step back, and I won't talk too long, I promise. Um, back in uh, more than a year ago, a year and a half ago, um, Anjay and Ria commissioned a set of wise persons, ex an expert group uh, comprised of five um, persons of gravitas who were no longer serving in supervisory roles but who had extremely significant experience. And without um, a crisis on our hands and a moment when the market wasn't broken in some way, um, asked the question, how do we continue to evolve our supervision? How do we have the most impactful supervision? How do we be the most effective supervisor? How, what are the things that we could be looking at? And gave them an open door into our processes and our policies. Did they have access to all the documentation, bank-specific information? No, we protected the confidential information and anonymized things that um, would have been uh, releasing any confidential information. So, but they had access to all of the processes and they had the ability to review anonymized information to understand our supervision and the impact of it. Why is this important? The week that uh, I think none of us got any sleep back in March when um, we had the events in the US and the events in Switzerland occur, and everyone around the world was asking the question about effective supervision, we delivered a report about the effectiveness of supervision. And it found that our supervision is effective, but it also made very important recommendations about how we can continue to evolve. And you're picking on one of the um, key recommendations and the language in the report, and, and it's appropriate which was uh, the finding that um, we have so far been capital-centric. And the building of the, of the SSM, of course, this is everything related to our history. The SSM was born into a moment when confidence in the banking system was completely shaken, the sovereign doom loop needed to be broken, and the recapitalization of the banks needed to occur. So the supervisory efforts were really geared at the things that led us to being able to withstand the triple threat that we found ourselves in earlier this year. Um, that doesn't mean that um, we are not going to use our capital tools. It's, we, in supervision, we always say capital is king. It means that we have a whole set of tools that we haven't exercised our muscles with and to date, and that now we will be, in addition to 
paying very close attention to capital and using the very powerful tools we have to do capital add-ons where we see too much risk developing. But we will now also exercise those tools in the context of remediation. I think one of the key learnings from the dislocation that occurred in the market earlier is supervisors need to act timely. And it isn't necessarily with slapping on a capital charge that you get the change that's needed. You need to hold banks to account to remediate processes that are weak in their risk management that lead to a weakened risk profile so that they can be strengthened. And the way to do that is by putting in place escalation measures, findings that follow through on non-remediated problems, and ultimately taking sanctions with penalties where institutions haven't followed through on the things that need to be, um, need to be strengthened from a risk management point of view. So I would say that um, you will see us going forward using the rest of that toolkit, which uh, Sean said this before, is, 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 is a sign of maturity of the, of the supervisory process no longer in its infancy. I'd argue it's beyond its teenage years. And I'd argue that it's a, an appropriate time for us to be implementing remediation measures and holding banks to account. Dominique, I, I cannot resist, since we're both here, asking you about this articulation between the supervisory function of the uh, SRB and the supervisory function of the SSM, perhaps at its most sensitive point, which is the failure or likely to fail the, the uh, point of non-viability determination. Um, I, I remember uh, your predecessor, Elke Koenig, talking about that, but, uh, but, but I, I, I was intrigued by the case of Sberbank, where, if I'm not mistaken, both organizations made a failing or likely to fail determination. Both of them communicated about it, uh, which was different from the previous cases, uh, where only the ECB had made this determination and the SRB just took it from there in terms of its public interest assessment. Can you tell us more about whether that's a signal of a change in philosophy or how we should read that? Well, uh, Nicolas, sorry, I, I know that you're an academic and not a lawyer, but uh, in, in... I don't in, have a PhD, in, I don't qualify in, as an in, in, in reality, <laughs> uh, I don't see a lot of difference between the different cases. In both cases, we had, we had to uh, assess the failing or likely to fail situation on both sides. This is exactly what is written in the, in the, in the, in the regulation. Uh, that means that indeed a, the first assessment is made by the supervisor. At the moment, the supervisor says, well, I've taken all the measures I could take, capital-centric, uh, risk management-centric, whatever, but at the moment, you know, facts are coming so quickly and in the wrong direction that we cannot act anymore. At that moment, based on some criteria, the bank is considered failing. But one of the of the yardstick put in the, in the regulation is to say, okay, but uh, careful, because either the, the supervisor could say too lately uh, that the bank is failing or too early to, to pass the baton to somebody else. So that's why there is this second assessment, which is made by the resolution of 30. And indeed, we restart the, the process, considering quickly, under pressure, but with a, a lot of expertise, I would say, where uh, the bank is. And uh, we confirm uh, or not uh, our, a, 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 let's say, a judgment on the situation of failure or potential failure of this uh, uh, bank. And in the cases mentioned by uh, uh, Anna Botin, uh, Banco Popular, it's bad bank you mentioned, we, 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 we did the same. Uh, then, indeed, if you speak from a legal perspective, a recent uh, uh, case law brought about, uh, by the way, uh, not uh, the Banco Popular case, but, uh, but another one uh, on which we decided to consider that the bank was failing, but we decided not to go for a resolution decision and to let the bank go to a liquidation process. Uh, the, the, the court, the European court, said that the last say, legally speaking, should be for the single resolution board. But this is just a technical uh, element which gives the, the final say to, 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 to the single resolution board. But in reality, in the case you've mentioned, Bear Bank, yes, indeed, we, we were obliged to assess the situation and to say that, a, and by the way, this is an interesting case coming back to what Elizabeth said a, a minute ago. This was not a question of capital. 
it was a question of implementation of sanctions due to uh, something coming from elsewhere, the beginning of the war in Europe between uh, Russia, Ukraine, invasion of Ukraine. And based on these sanctions, this bank, which was owned by a Russian interest, was not able anymore to work despite an enormous amount of capital. So uh, we were obliged to consider that this bank was failing due to an operational risk, creating a situation where the bank was not able to continue its business. And on that one, I think we all agreed between supervisors and resolution authorities to take the right decisions. Very interesting. So that means in future cases, there will be this double decision again? Yeah, okay. indeed. Um, Anna, uh, I assume I was not the only one in this room to be struck by the contrast uh, not on facts and uh, analysis, but in terms of tone between what Jacques Delarosière gave us about particularly European deposit insurance and, uh, and, and what you told us. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, of the uh, largest five banks by assets in the Eurozone, uh, four are French and yours are fifth one. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> can you give us a bit more about the difference of opinions in that, or maybe a little bit of an expanded group? Sure. We don't just measure ourselves by assets. I think of we course. should measure ourselves by what counts, which is customers. And if you uh, take Santander by number of customers, would be the number, the third bank between Europe and the Americas, and by far the largest bank in Europe. So we have 166 million customers. This is really important. We are here to serve our customers, people, and businesses, uh, and our mission is to help them prosper. So that's a, a big point. It's not just about assets. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't have the pleasure of having spoken to Mr. De La Rosier. I, I don't think we, we think differently. We're just seeing it from a different perspective. And perspective is everything in life. And so I'm seeing it from the perspective that I am entrusted with a lot of capital from my shareholders, and I need to make the best decision for my shareholders mm -hmm. in a way that is, of course, re regulatory compliant and uh, according to our own risk appetite and all these other things. And that is why um, I, I don't think we think differently. I, I think we would all benefit. Citizens, companies, the financial system, Europe would benefit for a more integrated Europe. And you know, my colleagues in the French banks and I were very much aligned in what is important. Sometimes we have minor differences, but, but I think we would all benefit from capital markets union, banking union, a more integrated euro. You know, I, I don't forget the exact, I'm a huge fan of Europe. I say that everywhere I go. I think Europe is the best system we have. As Madame Lagarde was saying before for the supervisory system, Europe is not perfect, but it's the best system we know. And I always say when we're at the right side of options in Europe, this works. And we just need to get in that range of options to a better growth model, sustainable growth, responsible growth. And again, you know, deposit insurance, it's only one of many different pieces that we need to get right. Uh, I don't remember now the exact, and I see a colleague from the US here, you know, what Europe has done since the Europe was born and the Euro was born is amazing. If you think about what the US and how long it took the US to get to an integrated currency, I'm sure Mr. Barr knows, 150 years, something like that. It's taken us 50 years. So when, when people say Europe is slow, you have to put that in perspective, <laughs> in historical perspective. And so I do think there's many things we need to do together. I do think the single supervisory mechanism has been incredibly important, a huge success story in record time. Uh, I think they have achieved something which is really important, which is a great collaboration with the financial system. Uh, and, and so I don't want to go on and on because that's not the question, but you know, don't try to, you know, European banks all want the same thing and the same thing that Brussels wants. And I think we just need to get there as soon as we can, but you know, also take a step back and, and, and from the perspective of where we have gotten in, in this time. So again, I think all banks in Europe would like further integration, not just in the banking system, but within Europe, and we just need to go step by step. There is certain things we can do, and again, to me, the elephant in the room is how do we get faster growth? Yeah. That is the biggest prudential, social, economic issue we have. And so, uh, well, I can go on about, <laughs> how I believe we can get there, but 
you know, it takes a lot of effort. It's going to take politics. By the way, we're in an economy that's digital. This, you haven't asked me this question, but taxes is a very popular theme in Europe. Mm. Bank and taxes, let's go for oh. that. So I have said publicly many times that I'm a good citizen. Where does Santander makes its pre-tax profit? A third in Europe, a third in North America, a third in South America. Where does that profit go to? A third for my shareholders, a third to taxes, a third, and a third to making more loans. So when people say- There's a third in taxes? How is it divided third. between yes. Spain, uh, Europe, North America and South America? Uh, it's not that different. Okay. It's not that different. We, when we make more money, we pay more taxes. For many years, we've made very little money in Europe, even in some cases lost money with negative rates. We have a trillion, very much retail, small accounts. We could not charge. The ECB was charging us on the other side. So day one, you pull up the blinds, you start from a not easy place. Now that a situation is different. So we paid less taxes in the past in Europe, more in other countries. The average for the group, about a third. When I see proposals from Brussels that we should have a minimum tax rate of what, 15%? Oh my God. That's the Irish man. So, no, let me say, I am very happy to increase taxes on banks, but banks are the plumbing of the economy. And we gave this number as the Spanish Banking Association. If you take three billion more in taxes from the banks, that is 40 billion less in loans when you're already paying more than the fair share in every market. And so I think there's a fundamental rethink we need to do, and I know it's being done, and I know it's not easy. Where do you create value in the digital economy? Because if my payments are now, now done by, I've said this publicly, so I'll say it again, Apple. Goldman Sachs, no longer. No, Goldman Sachs is fine. No, this is, this is a very real cases we have presented. So, you know, it, it, uh, that, Okay. Sean, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you can respond to the taxes if you want, but I have two questions for you on the legislative agenda. Um, well, actually three questions um, on three different pieces of legislation, which are, I think, all germane to our topic. One is uh, Basel III. Chair, Vice Chair Bauer here is uh, very busy on Basel III and game uh, in the US. Uh, we'll probably uh, talk about it later in this, uh, not in this session, but in this forum. Uh, is the fact that the adoption of the Basel III and game um, takes uh, time and energy in the US, uh, is there a risk that this would delay the adoption in the EU or not? Uh, second, crisis management and deposit insurance, EMDI. Uh, is there any chance that something in, on that front gets adopted before the end of the current legislative term? But third, which is actually germane to banking supervision, not to prudential supervision, maybe in a narrow sense, uh, the European Commission, to its credit, has proposed very ambitious legislation in anti-money laundering and the creation of an anti-money laundering authority, AMLA, uh, I think this is a major reform, probably the biggest in this term, in the area of financial services, uh, and in a way the little sister of the SSM, right, And uh, in, in many ways, because I don't think this reform could have been proposed if the uh, proof of concept hadn't been here with European banking supervision on the prudential side. Uh, is there a chance the AMLA legislation will get adopted in this cycle? All right. Um, well, I'll start by saying I don't concede defeat on anything for the moment, but I will order them in order of degree of challenge, let's say. Basel is easy one. Um, we are now through with Basel. We had a minor technical difficulty, which actually relates rather well to the discussion we were having earlier, um, but that has now been sorted. So we have made it clear we will stick with the uh, 1st of January 25 date. Member states have agreed with that. I think it's because, of course, there's always a level playing field discussion here, but you, know, you do these things because you believe they're the right things to do. And if they're the right things to do, you do them. If someone's going to come later, so, so be it. But it's not a question of us sort of subordinating the level playing field to what's the right thing to do. And so I think um, I'm confident that the US will deliver. I'm confident the UK will also come on board. And then we will have the three large jurisdictions and then it will be done. 
So we are not moving, moving our dates. I would stri remind people that we have a 10-year transition on some of these things, and I know Andre is very happy about them, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we're not you, talking in terms of... You can of relax because the markets bring it forward, so don't worry about the 10 years. Mm. Did, did he pay you to say that? No, no. Okay, it's fine. He didn't, but we talk a lot. <laughs> it's fine. On the second one, which I think is most likely, is, is the anti-money laundering. I think that's going quite well. Uh, in one part. So the regulation is going pretty well. I think we will have a, it will probably be settled in the Belgian presidency though. So it'll be carried from the Spanish presidency into the Belgian. Similarly with the, with the authority, which is now of course a part of that package, so it cannot come into ex effect without the authority. Um, that's a slightly more complicated affair. But again, I think we're reasonably confident that uh, we can get the process. It's more a process <laughs> issue there. We have nine candidate countries, as, candidate cities, I should say, for the authority that has to be um, processed. It's a slightly more complicated process than it has been in the past because the court has decided that, in fact, uh, the parliament should also be involved in the decision. I mean, it didn't decide it that way. It decided that the authority should, location should be named in the legislation. And therefore, in consequence of that, it has to be done in co-legislation, which means the Parliament are involved. I don't think either the Parliament or the Council want to delay the AMLA, but of course this will be a precedent-setting institutional arrangement. So all future I, I, for one, think it would be tragic if uh, what you mentioned resulted in the legislation not being adopted, given what's at stake on the substance uh, and the integrity of our market, especially in the context of, frankly, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, so, uh, so, so, to me, one cannot overestimate the importance of getting over those procedural is issues. Isn't, is yeah. it, do you think there is understanding of that at the political level in the member states? Well, it's not for want of the Commission telling them. So, um, I mean, I agree with everything you say. I mean, we tell them. I think, you know, I feel a little bit that AML is uh, the kind of innocent victim of a car crash. You know, we were just walking along and this institutional issue has arisen just before we are going to get our location. I think both sides are pretty well aware that this is not any authority here. This is a very particular authority. So the pressure is on and we're keeping the pressure on. And I'm, I'm confident we will get it across the line. But again, in the Belgian presidency, more likely. And then there's CMDI, um, which is something close to my own heart. Um, Again, I, I, there, is, there is a path to uh, adoption, I think, in this mandate, but it's very difficult and very, very tricky. And it's not just that the issues are very complicated, it is also that the, the proposal came relatively late in the mandate, uh, and the co-legislators have had to get themselves organized. They have done, but it's still a bit of a call <coughs> to get everything ready. So even if we don't get that, done in this mandate, it will carry over into the next mandate and of course it will be finished. It will be finished then. There's no risk that this one will not be um, handled in the next mandate if, if it misses. And it's really important in the context of banking union that this is done, in fact. Is there another legislative file uh, that you would like to mention here or? Is it not a... This was my short list of legislations, but you have a ton of more. I could give you 20 more, I think, need, but I mean, we only have a few minutes, but... Um, <laughs> um, okay. No, I think you've picked the three who are probably top of the list for us. Um, I feel lucky. Uh, Torsten, uh, I'll ask you an academic question. Oh. Uh, and um, you mentioned the success, I mean, everybody mentioned the success uh, of, uh, you know, resilience, as you put it. So there's a supervisory piece of that, and we've all paid tribute to it, I think, properly, but there is also a regulatory piece, right? Because we implemented Basel III, even in a materially non-compliant way, but let's not talk about that. Uh, and uh, we had this combination of regulatory tightening and supervisory uh, improvement, right? So in your model, if I can use that word, um, what have been the respective contributions of regulation and supervision in the improvement in resilience? Well, I think it has been not just both of them, but also the interaction between the two. Because if supervisors have more tools, more regular tools available, of course, they can also uh, well, implement them, force banks to adopt them. So I think it has been the kind of individually 
has been good, but again, and, but also the interaction. And again, if you think about, I mean, regulations are letters uh, are on paper, right? They have to be, of course, uh, monitored. They have to be enforced. That's what supervisors do, right? And of course, there's also, it's one thing is the regulation, one thing is actually the letter of the regulation, the other one is actually also the spirit of the regulation and applying them as intended, right? And we've seen, again, coming back to what I mentioned earlier, with the, the comprehensive assessment, yes, there were certain regulations in place, but they were not always uh, exactly followed. That's why we had this huge variation in quality um, uh, uh, asset, uh, in asset quality, and of course also then the, uh, the variation between, uh, uh, between banks and the capital shortfalls in going into the... Uh, so for you, is it like 75% supervision, 25% supervision? <laughs> Yeah, it's a big number. You're not going to pin me down on that one, sorry. I uh, would say half, half. If you want to, okay. half, half. Well, a third each, and then a third the interaction between the two. Pretty good. Um, okay, so uh, over with my questions, uh, and uh, now uh, over may, to may, you. May, um, may, may, may I intervene here? Yes. Because I think this raises a very, very important question. Because indeed, in Europe, we, we have always this debate about the what regulation do we need and what is the level of flexibility we let to the, let's say, broad sense supervisors. And there's a tension here. Uh, obviously, there's a question in confidence, not only in the regulation framework, but also in the supervisory world. Mm -hmm. Can we trust these guys are implementing these rules, level playing field, et cetera, et cetera. And, and in, in, in my current position uh, in charge of uh, managing uh, crises, this level of flexibility is absolutely key, and this is a message I would like to pass on, is that uh, we don't need to craft and carve in stone everything in regulation if we want to find sufficient flexibility to implement successful decisions. And I think again and again it's a question of trust. Trust in the regulatory framework and trust in the ones in charge of implementing it. And the more we trust the ones implementing it, and I think this conference shows that we can trust the ones implementing it, we can give more leeway by giving more flexibility in the framework. And it's absolutely crucial from my point of view. Interesting. Um, now over to the audience. I have several questions online, but let's start with one question from the room over there. Yeah, um, hello, Tom McAleese, Alvarez and Marcel. Um, I didn't know this is Andre's um, going away party, but anyway, I did want to uh, thank him. I, I'm part of a group, uh, the, uh, it's the uh, Banking Supervision Market Contact Group. Uh, Andre's not a, a supervisor this stays in his ivory towers. He's actually opened it up for um, market participants to come in and meet him on a regular basis and uh, take commentary and challenge from us. Not that he probably takes a lot of it on board, but he does uh, give <laughs> us the opportunity <laughs> To, uh, to listen and, and, and I think that we I think people on the group are actually very uh, committed to that group and, and, and thank you for doing that so I think that's an important part of, of your role what you've brought into the roles thank you I, I had just a quick question there was about, I think three people had mentioned the sovereign bank nexus as being a systemic risk in in this in, in, in Europe I, I, I thought that had actually gone away if you look like countries like Egypt and Pakistan and, and, and other emerging markets, their banking sector, 60, 70% of their banking assets are in government paper. I think we are way, way less than 20%. So I'm just going to mm, interested that this topic is back on the radar again. Uh, that's a good question. So uh, who wants to pick that up, um, Torsten? Well, I mean, the one big difference between uh, Egypt, Pakistan on the one hand and the euro on the other hand is that they, um, they, they have their own currency and the euro countries don't have their own currency. I mean, that's at the, at the, the, the core of it, right? Um, so I think that's the, the comparison is not, uh, is not uh, quite correct, I would say. Um, I mean, I I'm not, don't, don't want to raise any, any warning bells here, I mean, of, of immediate concern. It is just that in general, that the, the, the national bias of banks towards holding bonds of their own sovereign hasn't really gone away, also because there hasn't been any regulatory response to that. So this is, um, this is the point that I wanted to make. And indeed, right. if you look at the numbers that are published by the European Banking Authority, you see that the trends have not been downward, basically, in the last, since the entry into force of European banking supervision, the home bias is what it used to be. Uh, Anna? No, I, I think that uh, that link has not completely been broken, but it's much less, again, in great, great uh, 
uh, apart due to the single supervisory system. Today, the problem we had in the previous crisis is that people did not trust individual banks because of the country, but very importantly, individual banks. Today, everybody knows the standards of supervision in Europe are the same, they're super high, they're being effective, so they can trust our numbers. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a very different scenario, and I think that is a huge difference to what we saw in the previous crisis. We still need more, but I think 70, 80% of what concerned market participants is gone. Plus, of course, that the levels of government bonds in European banks is way less than in other markets. And so uh, that is also really important. Uh, many, many other factors, but I think the SSM has been fundamental. And we've tested that recently. You know, a, a big Swiss bank, very big, very interconnected, uh, you know, ended up uh, as we know. So the, if, if you want to test that this is a different, totally different situation. I'm not even going to talk about the increased capital liquidity, I mean, the individual strength, but the, that's not the issue because that could have been the case before. Now people trust going to Dominique's. They trust the system because they trust the supervisor and that is fundamental. Well, we, we, we all mark your words. Um, I think from an academic perspective, uh, the bank sovereign vicious circle uh, is a vulnerability. It's, 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 uh, it's something you assess in terms of crisis scenarios, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I think if you, if you take that crisis scenario perspective, we're not in a very different place from what we were during the Eurozone crisis. The big difference is the resilience, is the, uh, is the fact that there is more capital. So that, as you said, mitigates uh, powerfully, the bank sovereign vicious circle. I'm sorry, it's not just capital. As Elizabeth said, it's much more than capital. Okay. Much, much more. Okay. Um, so there's a question inevitably about the Capital Markets Union, and I thought we would escape that, but we don't. Uh, maybe to you, uh, Sean, uh, because this is a backward looking uh, panel, and we're getting closer to the end of the panel, but I'd like to have your views. Uh, what has been achieved in that um, department, which is really important? I mean, I think a lot has been achieved in terms of legislative proposals. I mean, under my uh, tenure as Deputy Director General and Director General, we've implemented two capital market union action plans. I think there were 20 actions in the first one, 16 in this one. I remember Commissioner's Barnier, Commissioner Barnier's color-coded Excel yeah. spreadsheet. Yes, uh. I don't use that, but uh, it's still available if you want it. Um, <laughs> But I think the issue is what's happening on the ground, frankly. So the legislation is in place, but <coughs> there is less happening on the ground. I think we have to uh, admit to that. And I, I will say what I've been saying publicly uh, quite a bit now is that when I was preparing for our first EU-UK uh, forum, which was the first we've had since Brexit, and the first kind of formal connection, structured dialogue we've had with the UK, I was very struck by the fact that they're almost doing everything that we're doing. <laughs> So we had a listing act, they have worked on listing. We have an IPO fund, they're working on IPOs. Prospectus, they're working on prospectus. Really all the way down, SME all the way down. The pr issue being that they have a single market already. Between Northern Ireland, Scotland and... They have a thing. <laughs> it's all in London, but it's there. So if they're doing this, even though they have a single market, what are we doing? And I think what we're doing is partly just tweaking our existing market, which is the prospectus, the listing, et cetera. But if you want to build a capital market, and I here defer to the, the president, you've got to do the hard stuff, hmm. which is the supervision, which is the accounting, is the taxation. This stuff is what builds. I mean, if you think what are the characteristics of any single market, it is common laws in areas like supervision, taxation, accounting, corporate law, securities law, you got it. No, this is very hard stuff. But just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Mm. So I think we have achieved a lot in terms of uh, CMU, but maybe we need to do a little bit more of the hard stuff. I'm, I'm so happy you mentioned accounting uh, as an accounting nerd myself, but I think this is really an important piece that doesn't get uh, sufficiently discussed. Torsten. Very quick points. Um, number one, yes, uh, we need to diversify the financial system looking beyond banking. I made this point earlier. 
Uh, and I think actually the SSM can actually contribute to this by making the banking system more stable, but also by being, focusing the banking system more. Um, which actually, I want to pick up on something that Mr. De La Rosier had uh, said. I mean, there is a tendency from a very low level, but the share of non-bank financing is increasing for corporates also in Europe. Again, much lower level than in the US, but it is increasing, which of course raises the question of ultimately uh, uh, supervision and regulation. I think there is a little bit of a gap, and I take your points that you made on the, uh, on the ESRB, but I think um, one important task that I would see for an institution like the ESRB, and I have to just to, as a, to mention that I'm, I'm also part of the structure, so these are these structures, I'm a bit biased there. But I think uh, for macroprudential supervisors, it's always to look beyond the current regulatory parameter, to always see potential new sources of systemic risk that might come up. So again, both from the growth and from the systemic stability side, I think that's absolutely critical to look at. Actually, I, I, I was listening to uh, Jacques Delahousier on the ESRB, and I, I personally don't disagree with what he said, but I think what you mentioned is important. The Scientific Advisory Council, or whatever it's called, of yes. the ESRB, yes. in my mind, has made a much bigger contribution than the ESRB itself. I mean, in this sense, actually, the ESRB is unique because, actually, they, I mean, I'm part of the AC. And, right? and, 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 and there, have votes, been, there have been several reports of the Scientific Advisory Council that had made I, that have, I think, made a, a, a yep. significant policy impact. I, when I think of the report on overbanking, the report on sovereign exposures, I think they have framed the debate uh, in a big way, so, so I'm happy you mentioned that. We have uh, three and a half minutes left. Uh, we want to end on time, but there is a really nerdy question coming online, and uh, since we're all uh, you know, uh, closet nerds uh, when it comes to accounting and capital. I cannot resist asking that one, probably to you, uh, Elizabeth. I'm reading the question. Uh, jumping to credit risk and IFRS 9, what do you think of overlays that represent a large part of impairments exercised on expected credit loss models? I actually like overlays. <laughs> um, and I might surprise you by saying that. Um, you know, we found during the pandemic that we were in a whole new cycle that had no historical data associated with it that could be relied on. So the answer was to put appropriate overlays in place so that institutions could appropriately assess their credit risk. Um, I, I would add that now we have some experience with the overlays. It's essential that institutions are testing them and beginning some back testing and that you know, we as supervisors are looking very carefully at the adequacy of them and whether they are being appropriately applied. But I like overlays. There's uh, uh, time for one last question from the room. If anybody has a crisp question on the big picture, take your chance. If not, one, two, three. If not, I'll take a big picture question from uh, the online audience. Um, and um, I'm not sure for whom it is, maybe for the supervisors here, so Elizabeth and Dominique. Uh, how can further banking consolidation be combined with too big to fail concerns? I think that's a big one. I can start. Um, you know, when I look at the consolidation that happened in the U.S. after the great financial crisis, and I look at the consolidation that's happened in Europe after the great financial crisis, there is a chasm between the two experiences. Um, we have a long way to go in Europe, I think, to improve our consolidation across borders. And having Capital Markets Union would certainly help with that. I think there's a need to, to have more consolidation in our market. We have overbanked markets. We have business models that are sluggish. We have vulnerabilities that exist as a result of overbanked markets. Starting with some consolidation would not really cross over into the too big to fail situation. We're very far from that picture in Europe. Actually, I'd like to hear Dominique on this, but maybe also very briefly at the end, Anna, because mm. he's the consolidator. I was going to put up my hand, but yes, very, very but good. But I'm so, looking at the. At yeah, we have uh, we have less top. than one minute, so please be concise. A, well, a, there, there is a misunderstanding about this too big to fail notion. It's not about uh, downsizing the size of the banks. It's to find other <coughs> solutions than public money. Too big to fail to be uh, saved by public support. Uh, we are always missing the last words in, the, uh, uh, in this sentence. So the answer is coming exactly from the resolution framework, saying, well, okay, too big means okay. adequate uh, treatment. Very clear. I won't have time for the follow-up question about Credit Suisse, but 
uh, that will be for another session. Anna. I, I don't have the answer to that question, but I can tell you <laughs> Europe needs larger banks mm. because our industry is being fundamentally disrupted big time, and this is going to accelerate. We need the capacity to invest, to reduce price to consumers and finance the economy. So we really need to do something about it. I keep on hearing European champions. We also need banks in Europe to be at the level of the US banks. 10 years ago, the largest bank in Europe, by market value in this case, was Santander. Today, the largest bank in the US, by market value, is the addition of, what, 15 largest banks in Europe? And of course, even the big American banks can compare to the big tech platforms, which are going to be the biggest competitors. And so we do need larger scale among European banks. But as we've said, it ain't going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty powerful uh, way to conclude. Uh, Torsten, if you have I, an even yes, more just powerful to, way. Directly to follow up on this. Too big to fail for whom? For the nation state? or for, the Euro for Europe. And I think that's a huge difference. And I think that's a get yet another argument to push forward with the banking union. Mm. Mm. Let me uh, take that as a conclusion uh, temporarily and ask the audience we to uh, huh? we thank yes. our panelists for what I thought was no, a very no. animated yeah. conversation. <laughs> I know. No, I mean, we, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, panel members. Thank you, Nicolas, for moderating. So we all get a break now. We'll take a short coffee break and come back for our next panel at 16.45, a quarter to the hour. Thank you.
And we're back from our break, a little bit later than planned, but we are back and we're going to our last panel of the day, Modern Supervision, What is Key? And which follows obviously from the, from the panel before. The moderator of this panel is Naomi Lloyd, a presenter, media trainer, and journalist for Euronews. Naomi will introduce the panelists, so over to you, Naomi. Thank you, Connie. Well, we heard in our previous discussion the stock take, the progress that's been made over 10 years, and this panel, we're looking to the future. At a time of unpredictability, with one global crisis seeming to follow another, the demands on the banking supervisor have changed fundamentally, we agree. And at the same time, the banking business is being shaped by the digital transformation. So how to adapt? How to ensure that modern banking supervision stays modern, is modern, in the face of the next crisis from wherever that comes? Well, with me to bring clarity and illumination to this topic are my distinguished panel of guests who need very little introduction, but they are Marlene Amstead on the left, who is chair of the Swiss Financial Market Supervisory Authority. We have Jose Manuel Kemper, chair of the EBA. Kirstin Afjotnik, member of the supervisory board here at the ECB. We have Davide Talienti, chair of global public sector at Oliver Wyman, an international management consultancy firm. And Nicolas Terry, chair of Credit Mutuel. So a warm welcome to all of you, a very distinguished panel. As I said, before we dive in, a reminder that we do want to hear from you. We want to have audience questions and we will be allowing time for that at the end. Whether you're online, do send them in now or here, we'll have the roving microphone later. So hold on to those burning questions and we will do our best to come to them. So let's get started. My first question then to our panel is, how would you define a modern supervisor in just two or three words? I'm gonna ask all of you and start with Marlene and then work our way along. So Marlene, to you first. Well, if I have only, really only three words, I would say first traditional, which might come as a surprise, hmm. uh, technology neutral and uh, tech savvy. Okay, thank you. Jose Manuel. Um, to complement those, I would say forward looking and intrusive. Thank you. I would say intrusive because uh, we need to turn all the stones and challenge banks. I would say uh, flexible and agile because we need to adjust to the um, risks and the outlook for the economy. And then I would also like to say fair because uh, as a SM as a supervisor, we have some very large banks, but we have also smaller ones. So it's important that we are proportionate and that we also create a level playing field for all the banks. Thank you. David. Can't we just clone him? <laughs> uh, no, too few. Organizational psychologist, curiously, and then a historian. It'll come back later. Okay. For me, and after 10 years, normally in the following five years, you have the first love story. So the love story between the supervisor and the banks should be on three proofs of love. First, uh, focused, then open-minded, and dynamic. Thank you. I like the mention of the love story. So that gives us a flavor of the discussion to come. My next question to you then, and I believe you've come prepared, is what key tool should every modern supervisor have at their disposal? And I do believe you've each, hopefully, bought an object that represents this. I do like a bit of show and tell. And we'll go in the opposite direction. Nicola, to you first. So the object is a four colors pen because you have to draw the, the mountains and valleys. Uh, this is the, the global picture. And then you have to move banks from black to green <laughs> and with some red and some blue in encouraging or uh, penalizing. Very nice. Thank you. David. Mine, Nomi, is not really an object. It's a work of art. Oh, it is. It is a total work of art. <laughs> Come back to my history point. Okay. <laughs> so, do you remember when the um, Roman generals paraded after winning their wars in Gaul or wherever, conquering the, the rest of Europe? I'm, I'm a Roman, by the way, so I'm very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> so it comes natural. There were, the, the emperor always had somebody right behind him saying two words. What do they say? Memento mori. You're going to die as well. Okay? Now, how is this relevant? Well, it's relevant as follows. Any chief executive needs 
the people within his organization or her organization to say, memento mori. You are a very dominant person at this point. You're a very dominant institution. And you need to be aware of your vulnerabilities. Carrying the scars of 12 years of having the pleasure of working with, with the ECB on all the various banking crises, history repeats itself all the time. And it's very clear that the absence of a memento mori within a failing institution is what causes that. Uh, so this is the tool that any supervisor should hand over to the chief executive and say, just remember. <laughs> Thank you, Kirsten. So uh, for me, uh, our staff are the most important in uh, the staff. They are an asset. So I brought a photo of uh, our staff. Oh. Uh, and, you know, we have uh, 1,100 people in here at the ECB, but we are working together with all our member countries. So together we uh, are more than thousands. And here they, I think there is a running competition. So they, it's very good that they are also doing healthy things, not just working on banking supervision. Very important. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, I, for me, I brought the iPad technology. I think very much aligned to what you said before. And I think as we go forward, being technology savvy is very important for any of us. Thank you. It's a very similar story. <laughs> <laughs> but Interesting, too, the it's, same it's object. It's not just the iPad. I That's thought, a laptop. I, I thought more <laughs> of kind of, first I thought of uh, the more traditional uh, version of the iPad. So I thought actually of, an, of a magnifying glass because I very much believe that when it comes to modern supervision, I think we really need to focus much more on data. So banks more than ever are data banks, yeah. and uh, there are huge piles of, of, of data, and so it gets more and more important that we do not only collect the right data and do not only connect then the right data, but that we have a magnifying glass where we can that really been your focus object. A magnifying on glass. Exactly, <laughs> focusing really on, uh, in a risk-based way uh, where the highest risks lie. Okay, thank you. Thank you to all of you. So as we're saying, we heard in the last panel the stock take on 10 years of European banking supervision. Kirsten, from the ECB banking supervision perspective, briefly, where are we at right now? What challenges lie ahead and what's needed to adapt? I, I think I, I'm a part of the story here a little bit, but I think we have made remarkable progress over the last 10 years. Uh, I was uh, chairing the Committee of European Banking Supervisors in 2008 and 9 when we were in the middle of the financial crisis and it was a very difficult time for supervisors. There were no trust in supervisors, there were no cooperation among the supervisors, there were different practices as was mentioned here earlier. So we have really made a remarkable results. Uh, the banking union step is of course a very important for us. There is more to do, as was also said here earlier. I mean, we would like to see the full banking union uh, up and running with the uh, deposit insurance scheme and the uh, full crisis management framework so that we can use also more tools in the crisis situation. Okay, thank you. Well, then the same question to you, Nicola, from the banking perspective. The challenges, what do you see? What's needed to adapt? Well, first of all, I, I want to pay tribute to Andrea and Ria because uh, before adapting, you have to recognize uh, the assets. Uh, and there is, for me, and that's the reason of my presence today, uh, real assets uh, coming from the supervision mechanism, notably um, the focus on business models and the forward looking uh, and the future of capital and liquidity. And uh, I would add a, a very psychological element which is uh, the confidence, the trust of dialogue, and the clarity of uh, the main priorities. And please do not adapt on that. Uh, it's important for the industry to have this kind of uh, previsibility and, uh, and clarity. Then we have common challenges, and uh, the main one for me is, of course, the risk profiles, and notably on climate but uh, also uh, to avoid because uh, banking is still a national industry. We have some national traditions. You know, in France, we have uh, regulations on savings. We have uh, fixed interest rates. Uh, we have a sort of social role of the banking industry. And uh, uh, on the risk profile, 
I understand the need uh, for unity, but there is no unity without recognition of diversity. And so uh, that's where I think there is some room of maneuver for adaptation. Then the second thing is uh, um, the previsibility of the supervisor. And uh, uh, I would say that sometimes having a common working table, common working program, leaving room for urgencies, of course, but would help to build this confidence and to create uh, an ability for each uh, bank, each and every bank, to uh, have a proper risk management dynamic. And that's where I, I think it's maybe very practical, very bureaucratic, but that's important on both sides. Okay, thank you. So we've, we've touched on the demands of the, how the demands of the banking supervisor have changed. So let's start with digitalization. It's rapidly changing the banking landscape. So let's have a talk about what are the implications of that for banking supervision. Marlene, can I come to you first? What do you see? Well, digitalization of journey of banks uh, definitely is a long and winding journey, and and uh, we're posing many many challenges, but also uh, opportunities. We see that globally. Uh, we see it in, uh, recently with the introduction of decentralized finance and permissionless uh, business models. Uh, we've seen that also in Switzerland uh, a couple of years ago when uh, DN and, and, and Libra uh, applied for a payment uh, license in uh, Switzerland. And so from all of these experiences, I would say I, I see three core uh, principles that really matter from a supervisory uh, perspective when it comes to uh, digitalization of, of banking. I think the, the first one is, is transparency. I think it's, it's really of utmost importance that uh, we have transparency in, in, those, in, in those business models and that's much easier said than, than actually uh, than actually achieved. And the, the second uh, core principle I see in digitalization is the international cooperation because with these digital models, we see they uh, do not uh, really end at the jurisdictional borders. And so more than ever, it is of utmost importance that we as supervisor, we have the same common uh, standards or common language, the similar taxo taxonomies. And so international cooperation, I think, in the digitalization of banking uh, is, is really of, of great uh, importance. And then the last aspect uh, is, again, I would say technology neutrality seems to me an important uh, core principle just uh, in order not to, to, for us as supervisors to pick the technology, but instead we set the guidelines, we set the rules, uh, we set the expectations, but in terms of which technology is the most innovative one, uh, that is then left uh, to the industry. So technology neutrality as a uh, way to achieve on the one hand innovative, but on the other hand uh, also safe financial markets. Thank you. And we're going to talk about transparency more as well. That is a key one. Davide, you have also a global perspective. What, what are you seeing related to that and your thoughts? For those of you that have studied China, um, and for good and for bad, by the way, in terms of the financial system, it's a uniquely interesting market. I'm going to exaggerate really brutally for effect, mm. but... If you look at the Chinese market at the moment, you have the big techs, their equivalent of the, the, the big techs, that occupy the client interface role, and they run away with all the economic value. Mm -hmm. You then have a very disorganized non-bank financial institution segment with all the bonds that we've all heard that is a mess and is probably going to be cleaned up. It'll take about 20 years to clean up. And then, of course, you've got the banks, the traditional banks, right? These, I'm exaggerating for effect, but the market has coalesced into these three broad segments with almost all the value accruing into the big techs. What is extraordinary about it is not just how much the value has migrated away from the traditional banking sector, but it's the pace at which it happened. So six years ago, the big techs were basically nothing in financial services in China, six or seven years ago, and now they are an utter dominant force. 
even after the crackdown that happened quite recently that we've all, that we've all seen. Now, why am I raising this? Because in Europe, it doesn't feel like we're in a stable endgame. Most banks are trading at half book value. Any sector, in any other sector, this would have been consolidated out, right? There would have been forces of consolidation that would have squeezed out the weaker players and we'd have much stronger and better, better valued uh, banks. It doesn't feel stable. Something is stopping that development. And I fear that we're probably on the cusp here. Fear, I hope, I don't know. It'll be for Claudia to see with her colleagues as she looks at the next five years, that the AI disruption which really is the manifestation of digital, may well accelerate some of the competitive differentiators in the market. If you look at the potential in productivity that AI brings within a financial institution, if it's just applied internally, before we even look outside in the market, it's phenomenal. So the banks that adopt this at pace are gonna have material cost advantage to most of their peers, and therefore will have the power to consolidate, maybe. That's even before the big techs decide to play in the game, which at the moment they've said pretty clearly, we don't really want to play in European financial services. Too much regulation for us, right? They're, they're the tech bros. They don't want to be regulated. I mean, <laughs> God, why would you want to be regulated? Um, when that changes, that could really start an interesting consolidation dynamic. Now, for supervisors, this is nothing short of a nightmare because you're, looking, you're probably looking at M&A situations that involve banks and non-banks never seen before. Second thing you're looking at is risk of disruption within the business models of the established players. Let's try and back test on generative AI. By definition, that's impossible, mm -hmm. right? And then the third is that you have a real human capital challenge, which is the institutions, uh, the banks and the insurance companies aren't really the most advantaged <coughs> knowers of this technology. So there's going to be some slippage here, for sure. And as a supervisor, through my shred processes, through my other things, I need to get a gauge of where is it that something could go wrong in this institution above and beyond all the traditional prudential levers. Which is why, Naomi, I said an organizational psychologist, because I think a sh there's a difference between a shrep and a shrep. And a tick box shrep is a disaster. Mm. A forward-looking business model challenging shrep that I think Nicolas was alluding to makes all the difference. And to have supervisors that can do that, that's tricky. Thank you. Well, the nothing short of a nightmare stood out to me. Kirsten, maybe to you as well. How prepared are you for this? I mean, uh, on the digital uh, agenda, I would say that we are doing quite a lot. And we have my colleague Elizabeth is chairing our steering committee for the digital agenda. And so, but, and on banks, I mean, we are, um, this is one of our priorities in our discussions with banks to make sure that they are making use of the digital solutions in their also change of the business models because we want, I mean, there are a number of banks which, uh, who don't have really a sustainable business model. And here we think that digital solutions can help them in the uh, future development. Having said that, we made a questionnaire to a number of banks in the beginning of the year uh, to ask a little bit, where are you? Uh, and um, uh, most banks have a digital agenda. Uh, most banks are, of course, developing solutions for their customers, did better solutions. Uh, but very few uh, banks had a transformation budget. I mean, they, you also, it's an investment to make sure that you can make use of the uh, digital solutions. So that is something that we will continue to discuss because we think that is important to invest for the future. So Nicola, let me throw that to you. Are you investing? Do you have the dedicated transformation budget? Yeah. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, but I will come. I will be very brutal, sorry, but uh, the banking industry is just about IT, human resources and customers. Uh, we have no intellectual property protection, so uh, on uh, digitalization I have a sing two single words, full control, full control of your IT system, no externalization, no public cloud, you have to control your system, your architecture, and at the core of your architecture, you need to have customers. 
and then you can protect your system, you can be resilient, no externalization, no public cloud, to be honest. And when I'm looking at different organizations and then when I see them going to the public cloud, for me, that's a clear and present danger signal. Mm -hmm. So on this basis, 8% of the workforce of Credit Mutuel is on IoT. Uh, we are spending 1 million days each year on IT developments. We put AI on our system, on mainframes, exclusively in France, because also for an environmental point of view, if you want to avoid to enlight things in Alaska, Greenland, uh, south of America, you have to be very focused on your data centers. And uh, AI, for the moment, after eight years in Credit Mutuel, uh, is involved in 20% of our sellings, and the return on investment is above 30%. And now we are moving for quantum, uh, and uh, on the very uh, and a co cooperation with IBM, with a data center in Frankfurt, because we asked IBM to put the uh, center in Europe to ensure full protection. And if I may, digitalization, this is the window dressing for customers. The real problem from a company is uh, a, a full control on the architecture, investment, and strategy on IT. And of course, having that, you can be perfectly digitalized. You can be very efficient for your customer. Sorry for this uh, very traditional way, but uh, uh, for example, uh, next year we'll have three uh, tier four data centers in France. And from my point of view, this is a key and basic condition of each and every bank in the market because you cannot be resilient, you cannot be solid, you cannot ensure your uh, capital ratio without a full control on your IT system. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Jose. Yeah, please. no, I just wanted to come back on that because I hear you, but that my sense is that that's a, a strategy that is not the common rule right now in the industry. The trends that we see are really going in the other direction, which we see large amounts of externalizations, making a lot of value added chains, particularly in the IT front. In the IT front, and that's, uh, we put forward a regulation in Europe that you may be familiar with, which is called DORA, Digital Operational Resilience, precisely because there's concerns that some of the banks, some of the financial institutions, not just banks, have more and more difficulty having control over the value added chain of their production process, and also the supervisors have also, as a result, not confirmed that that whole value of the chain is sufficiently robust to potential risk, particularly resilient risk. So this is actually a major area in which we're working now. If I may there, that's an additional complexity, which is not only breaks out the value of the chain within banks, but also connects the value of the chain across financial institutions and actually across other sectors in the economy. So the, inter the intersectoral relationships intersectoral connections becomes more and more. And I think as we go forward, that's probably one of the key areas of vulnerability that we see right now for the coming years and making sure that we assess that properly. Any other implications that you're seeing or how about AI? I mean, it's early days, but how's that going to affect banking supervision? Yeah, well, if I may, before I go to AI, another thing that I think is very important for us as, as supervisory authorities overall is to build human capital. You know, it's, it's an area in which uh, when we think about and when we do surveys, when we think there's like a tighter market, now that we are, as the ABA and the other supervisory authorities, building up our, our capabilities and our strength to do the digital operation resilient act that I mentioned before, the ability to have the right capital, human capital is very important. And one of the initiatives that we have here in Europe is we build this with the support of the, of the commission, the digital um, academy for supervisors, the digital supervisory academy in which we're providing training to try to, to build that up. I think that's very important. Now, when you think about uh, AI, I think more than AI. Did you want to respond to that? I saw you nodding. Did you have something to say that, no, that no, for no, me? No, it's, then please it's, carry it's, on. No, yeah. okay, sorry. No, I was just coming back now to your question on, on artificial intelligence. I mean, it's obviously something that we monitor and we started to monitor like I think everybody else. And I think we have to monitor from two perspectives, which is always good. Like one, uh, what are uh, supervised entities doing with it? And what are the implications they may of, of those changes that they incorporate to their systems and at the same time we have, we have to look inside ourselves and what can we do ourselves in a different way in a better way i think both of those 
levers need to be pursued. At this stage, I would say it's probably too early to draw any conclusions. It's a new technology. When I mentioned technological neutrality, I think it's important to see what the use cases come out of there. And, uh, not necessarily be open or close, just be honest and fair to that technology, what it can offer. But I think, at least from my perspective, is what, what we can do with it ourselves is almost just as important as what the industry can do itself with that technology. Kerstin, do you want to add yeah, to that? Yeah, maybe because I'm uh, rather proud that we have a, in our uh, SSM uh, activities developed, I think, rather cutting edge uh, tools. And uh, one is something we call Heimdall, and uh, it is uh, reviewing the application for, you know, we are fit and proper testing all um, board members, for example, in a bank, and we are getting thousands of those uh, fit and proper applications a year. So here we have an automatic, you can say, review of those uh, applications to uh, translate them, to make sure that all the information we need are in the applications. And then there are, of course, also a human uh, hand looking at them, but I think this for first uh, way of reviewing them is really helpful. So this is something that we are already using on a daily basis. We have also developed a sort of database with the I mean, main uh, um, analytics for our uh, supervisors. And I think that is also something very useful. And we have our intranet. So I mean, they have access to this uh, information uh, directly. And, and then the vision, maybe this uh, sounds a little bit bad for the banks, but I think the vision is, of course, that we can also have some real-time in time information from banks, because rather often we hear that uh, if we want to check liquidity, for example, we need it now. I mean, to get a report uh, three months uh, after uh, is not really uh, interesting. So. Here again, I mean, this is something that we would like to see. Not, of course, that we not that we will have direct access to the bank's books, but some uh, key indicators would be important also for us to, to see on a real-time basis. That's really interesting, Nicola. Yeah. Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Um, just to add a specific here in terms of dealing with the unknown, yeah. um, my bank offers me voice recognition. Mm -hmm. Maybe a lot of people in the room voice recognition. Now, that is utterly vulnerable these days, yeah. courtesy of Jane I. Right? Mm. And yet my bank is still offering me voice recognition. And I've said, guys, this is just not good enough. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it'll take them six months to recognize that problem. Yeah. That's the nature of the risks that are yeah. so present and imminent in the market. Yeah, not just on AI. My feeling is that the real debate is about the use you are making with AI. And we adopted AI uh, eight years ago. And uh, we refused the sort of big replacement theory, AI, uh, robots, replacing advisors uh, with the customers. And in reality, uh, AI is very good in our businesses uh, on uh, opportunities, frauds, uh, identification of uh, potentialities, just like uh, quantum uh, calculation. And, uh, when you put this kind of uh, uh, advices, opportunities, uh, frauds to the advisors, they are very efficient. Their efficiency is increasing, and uh, what we try to do is to enhance the relationship between the advisors and the customers. And when you look at it uh, uh, eight years later, it's really uh, good and efficient. So. Uh, when you are uh, inventing a technology, the real problem is uh, how you will use it. You can use your computer just to beat someone, <laughs> or you can use it to help you. Uh, and that's the real choice on yeah. the eye. It's fascinating. I think it's going to be interesting to see at the next forum how the conversation's moved on. It's changing so rapidly. Marlene, can I get your take? Is it yeah. AI blessing or a curse then for the banking supervision? Well, let me first just uh, add before I answer this question uh, that I very much agree with Jose that it has definitely these two sides. So one side is uh, the industry. So we just conducted uh, an extensive survey in the Swiss financial markets, not just with banks, but also with uh, insurance company, uh, companies. And what we found is that basically all of the large uh, institutions and most of the mid-size and small institutions already use one way or the other uh, artificial intelligence. 
uh, most of the apps are at the front of this or uh, in the process optimization, though this is two thirds of the applications. And uh, what, what is uh, also very interesting I found is that most of the banks, they do not only outsource uh, the development of uh, artificial intelligence, but they also start uh, their own uh, artificial uh, intelligence uh, programming. So there is, this, there is this mixture. So here and now, I think we already see that financial markets uh, already are very much reacting to artificial intelligence and, and, and using artificial intelligence. And then there is this other side, this would be the subtech mm -hmm. uh, side. So when we uh, supervisor actually make use of the latest uh, technology, I think there it's really very important uh, that at the very end we'll always have a human being who takes the final uh, decision. I think it's, it's uh, of great uh, uh, use and importance if uh, artificial intelligence is used to guide where human beings look further. But I think at the end, the final decision should should always be uh, with uh, should always be uh, with, with with humans. But when you ask me about uh, whether it's a blessing or or a curse, to to me it seems um, the the factor that kind of ticks the uh, to one or the other side is is really accountability. If uh, the system is set up in a in a way that it's always clear to where is this door to knock on when things go wrong, and that there is still some sort of a door to knock on when things go wrong, I think then we can really benefit from uh, the, the great uh, potential of artificial intelligence. But when it's unclear who is at the end held accountable, I think then we're, then, then we're definitely headed uh, for very, very challenging times as, uh, as, as supervisors. And, and so I think there is, this, uh, there is this saying about banking is necessary, but banks are not. And I would, I would I'm tempted to uh, kind of alter it a little bit by saying uh, banking is necessary. Banks might not be, but what's definitely necessary is a bank license. So you always need to be absolutely clear about who is held accountable uh, for uh, handling customers and handling investors. Thank you. I'm sure there's lots more to come back on on that, but I'm going to move it on to transparency. I promised we would talk more about that. Um, external institutional stakeholders and financial market players have repeatedly called on ECB banking supervision to increase transparency. I'd like to bring in our audience. You didn't think you were just going to sit there and do nothing. Um, and with a little show of hands, I'm going to ask you a question. Are supervisors, what do you think, are supervisors around the globe doing enough to be transparent? Hands up for yes, they're doing enough. Okay. Oh, yep, yeah, one over there. Good. Thanks, Connie. And uh, yep, good. And hands up for no, they're not doing enough to be transparent. <laughs> and I, yeah, okay. And some neutral, but certainly more for not enough. I think that was quite definitive. So, yeah, and I think one of the big questions is around how you balance transparency and confidentiality. So, Nicola, let me come to you first. Do you want to see more transparency from supervisors? With, with me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> with the others, I don't know. Um, no, uh, I think there is a need for uh, what I call a visibility, but uh, a common agenda. Basically, we, we, we should, both the banks and the supervisor, be absolutely transparent in terms of common agenda. And if I may, uh, between the different supervisors, it would help to have this kind of common agenda uh, uh, and uh, with an absolute need of transparency. And the second criteria for me is alignment. You should never say a customer or a market or an investor uh, something different from what you say to your supervisor. And the reverse is also true. And uh, uh, I think this kind of principles, uh, transparency and alignment uh, are the good ones to, to progress and to create uh, confidence. And to be honest, I think we did make a lot of progress from this point of view, including supervisors, uh, the frank dialogue, and the kind of selectivity between what you say on an all basis 
to the banks, what you say on a written basis, and what you say to the market. And these three levels of uh, transparency are needed. We need uh, a very good informal dialogue. We need a clarity on the written dialogue. And we need, of course, uh, to, to observe, to obey, or to uh, follow uh, the instructions, the public instructions coming from the authorities. Okay, so a lot of progress has been made hearing that there, but what steps need to be taken are being taken to increase transparency? I think we have lot, uh, we have done a lot, uh, not least because Andrea has been, uh, I think uh, someone said you have been a champion in transparency, but uh, we have tried to improve our transparency during uh, the last five years. And uh, uh, one thing is that we have, uh, we are now publishing the result from the supervisory review and evaluation process, the aggregate results. Uh, we are also uh, publishing the, the stress test result for individual banks. We are publishing the methodology for the SREP process because banks have asked, I mean, how come that we are scored uh, two or three or three plus? I mean, we need to understand better what is the thoughts behind. So we are doing more work in this area and we will probably publish also uh, more on the methodological side. Uh, our banking supervision market contact group was mentioned here earlier, but that has been also uh, the idea behind is to increase the dialogue with the market for us to explain why we are doing things in one way or another, but also for the market to be able to, to raise questions with us. And uh, over the last years, we have also been a little bit more uh, careful with how we are communicating. I mean, communicating with our banks is one thing, and there we can be open and hopefully also explain very well why uh, we are assessing banks in one way or another. But then we, we are an independent authority, so and we are accountable to the European citizens, to the Parliament, to the Commission. I mean, there are a number of stakeholders here, so we need to choose how we communicate with the different stakeholders. Uh, we have our website, of course, but we are also now communicating in social media in different ways in order to reach out. And Andrea, of course, has been in the parliament regularly to report to the politicians because that's important that they also understand how we are working, why we are taking certain decisions, and also that we are able to, to explain, I mean, our view on the banking sector. Okay, David, what are the challenges then between transparency and confidentiality? Yeah, I remember in when Andrea began the whole stress testing, and when he was at the EBA, in fact, um, we've been on a colossal journey with respect to communicating to the markets on a consistent basis across all the banks. So where we were 10 years ago and where we are now, frankly, is night and day. And this is an area where very controversially I think enough is being done. Why? Because careful what you wish for. Mm. You. If you start putting out there things that then the market overinterprets or underinterprets, whatever it may be, then you're causing a problem. And it feels to me like we've really got the, place, uh, the market in a place where they understand all the disclosures that are done by the SSM, they've internalized them, they know where to probe them, and the discussion moves on. So controversially, I wouldn't really do much more. The one, the one bit of transparency that nobody's really talked about, which is, I think, Merlin, you and I had a little, um, a little disagreement here. I, I worry enormously when I hear banks say, well, we could just give supervisors perfect access to our loan tapes, say our credit books, and so they know everything that we're doing, and what could possibly go wrong with that? Now, you create the most monstrous moral hazard, right? You can imagine if the bank says, well, the supervisor knows everything I'm doing, if they're not telling me I've got a problem, then there is no problem. And that's how you get into trouble, right? So I worry enormously about that part of transparency, which is how and how frequently the banks um, transmit the information to the SSM and in what basis. Because if we get too frequent and too transparent, I worry about big moral hazards coming into play. Nicola Quickly, as our banking representative, is that a fair comment? That's a fair comment, provided that uh, you are absolutely transparent on your global risks. 
Of course, you don't have to give to the supervisor each and every loan, but uh, notably on risk uh, under uh, uh, the, the, the interest rate uh, risk, uh, of course, on your strategy, you have to be very clear. And uh, if I may, that this is a danger of the ratios. Uh, mm. Maybe it's a, a side comment, but uh, uh, knowing the price of everything is knowing the value of nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, at a certain stage, I'm a bit careful with the figures, with the ratios, because uh, you have to put the global picture beyond each and every loan and to see if the management, the governance, and Andrea has underlined that, is okay as a function of reaction. And I think that's where the transparency needs to be absolute. This is my function of reaction in case of I would do that or I would do that. And that's more important than ratios and figures because at the end of the day, figures is just about reassuring the system but not giving the, the real value mm. yep. of what you're doing. Very quickly, maybe yes, one please quick do. Uh, remark. So I think in, in, in short, transparency does not mean necessarily more data or more uh, access to more information, but access to the right uh, information. So I think just if we are flooded with information from banks and if there is a pipeline directly uh, from in, to the extreme, uh, from uh, financial institutions to the to supervisory uh, authority, that, that's not necessarily transparent. Transparency. Transparency is about not, not about more data, but about, about the specific, the, the right data. And I think that, that should be the, the, the focus. Thank you. If, if, if I may, I mean, this, I think we're mixing two levels of transparency uh, in this conversation. One is transparency between a private relationship between a supervisor and a supervised entity, which is, has to do with more with predictability, I will say. Another one is transparency to the outside world or how that relationship is going. Mm -hmm and or what's the status of the banking sector in particular, the bank in particular. I think on, on the second aspect, on the transparency of how that relationship is going, I think that you have to be prudent. On the third aspect, on giving information about the situation of the banks, I think the experience has shown as we go forward that has always been en confident enhancing in general. You know, I think that particularly when there is a focus of concern in a particular area, uh, not being transparent, not being clear on where the information is, ends up being just a uh, ground for speculation rather than, 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 than having an intelligent conversation. I think, I think that communication to third parties, of course, at the EBA, since, since, uh, since Andrea started, we've always been very keen on providing information to markets to the point that we have something that we call the transparency exercise of the banking sector that we do twice a year. But I think that that, that aspect is important. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Right, I'm going to move us on. There's lots I want us to cover in this session, and it's going so quickly. <coughs> Let's talk about lessons learned as we look to the future with the recent banking failures. What lessons have been learned or not? I'm going to come to you first, Marlene, with the Swiss perspective or general perspective. Well, obviously, I mean, there have been um, two very different cases, the, the US banks and the, the, the Swiss banks, and I'm only going to uh, comment on the latter, uh, obviously. Um, I mean, there are uh, many lessons to, to be drawn from, the, from this. Uh, many people hoped that uh, there would be just one main lesson or one aspect, one magic wand tool uh, that uh, we, we can kind of install and then uh, uh, incidences as we've seen will t will, would never happen. But I think that's, that's, that's clear an illusion. So we, we, need, we have a variety of different, uh, of different uh, le lessons uh, to, be, to be learned. And uh, in the context of modern uh, supervision, in the other context, in the broader context, context we could go on for a, for a forum on its own. <laughs> um, uh, but in the, in the context of modern uh, supervision, I think I want to mention uh, uh, two, two lessons. Uh, the, the first one is uh, corporate governance is of utmost importance. That's really also what Andreas is also so much uh, em emphasizing. So uh, whether uh, it's a traditional business model or a very modern one, uh, if the corporate governance is not uh, sound, uh, then we're uh, headed for, for, for challenges or troubles as we've, as, as we've seen. And the challenge with corporate governance is that there, there likely will never be kind of one metric that will 
basically represent and signal what uh, is the stance of corporate governance. I mean, there is a feeling, we can uh, look into the market, we can use market uh, uh, figures uh, to get a judgment on what what's the market thinks about the corporate governance in the particular institutions. But, but still, there will be no quantifiable measure as we have with liquidity or with, with, uh, with capital. And from that, I think the, the, the lesson learned is that we as supervisor, we really need uh, the power and the legal clarity to uh, be able to intervene very early on. And uh, so in our case, in the Swiss case, we now aim for a, a senior manager regime among other uh, aspects, just to make uh, clear that we have kind of better cards uh, uh, for handling, to, to handle this type of corporate governance uh, challenges. And the next, the, the second lesson, uh, I think, which is important in the context of, of modern banking uh, is, of course, liquidity. I think we've uh, seen this massive bank run. Some uh, call it a digital bank run. And yes, we've come a very long way from Basel II to Basel III and, uh, uh, on, on, on liquidity measures. So back in 2008, we did not have really uh, a common ground. How we, have, we did not have the LCR uh, and FSCR to really measure uh, uh, liquidity. So we've come a, a very long way. Uh, but having said this, it's also obvious that th there is still room to further um, uh, to further increase uh, kind of what we can learn from from these type of measures. So different type of depositors and and uh, different regions. And I think that that's definitely uh, an important lesson uh, that we need to to draw and look closer into these uh, liquidity measures. This is even more the case when we have uh, not a traditional uh, business model as was with Credit Suisse, but uh, when we have these more uh, advanced or these, these more technology uh, driven uh, business models. Thank you. Jose Manuel, do you agree your thoughts? I agree with everything that has been said to me. I mean, if I might say just uh, two, two broader comments. First, that you have to be humble, you know, because you never know that it can happen to you. I think that's important. And then the second aspect is that we need to, and, and Andrea pointed to some of these earlier in his comments with the conversation with Laros here, but you need to be able to, how to in, incorporate into the supervisory agenda and your assessment of, this, of, of the banks and the situation. So like uh, market, but I don't mean by market, just financial market information, but just market information that moves very back. Social media, uh, perceptions, uh, market prices. That may be in price. There. I don't think we need to go 100% to market prices, but how to incorporate all that sort of high frequency information that's running around, that's moving faster and faster and faster, and they might materialize into a weakness that you haven't seen. I think that's probably, and, and that's hard to do. I mean, the liquidity part is very clear that we need to work on that, but also how do we integrate social media information, how do we integrate information coming from equity markets or the 81 markets that interact with each other? I think that's something that we need to work through. Kerstin, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, we are, of course, also studying the reports that have uh, been provided by Federal Reserve and the lessons learned and also by the Basel Committee. And my take from those two uh, reports is that very much of the, I mean, uh, faults or problems were linked to uh, governance and risk management, both in the banks and in the supervisory authorities. So. And uh, if you go, if you have an extreme uh, business model and you don't have good risk management and good governance, then it's not, it cannot be compensated with a lot of capital or liquidity. If there is not trust in a bank, then there is a problem. And I think that was what we uh, saw uh, very simplified in the U.S. banks. Uh, but I think for us, uh, the lesson learned is also as a supervisor, you need to act. It was, uh, if you see something that doesn't work, you need to act. And uh, that was mentioned in the first panel. Uh, of course, there shall always be a discussion with the bank and the bank is, they need to have time to uh, take rectifying, uh, I mean, uh, measures. But if they don't, uh, you need as a supervisor to be there and 
use your, your tools in order to press on the banks to make the right things. And I think here, I mean, we can have the, we can take as an example the uh, climate uh, risk uh, here in uh, the SSM. We issued our supervisory expectations on what banks need to do when it comes to climate exposures and their risk management around the climate exposures. And, uh, and um, uh, here we have uh, had a number of intermediate uh, stops where we need to see deliveries from the banks and we haven't seen that from all the banks so now we are escalating in what we call, I mean that's a jargon among the supervisors, but we, we escalate then and um, continue the discussion with the banks but at the end I mean we can use our tools like capital add-ons or we, we have also a uh, um, the amount, uh, we can use uh, other uh, fees that we can apply on the banks. Nicola, you heard that about the escalating. Was that your takeaway too, that supervisors need to act more quickly? They need to act adequately. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> if I may, on the lessons learned, one uh, short word, the business model is everything. Uh, uh, when you have a balanced business model, when you have a universal bank, when from our side you add uh, insurance business, uh, mobile phones, uh, housing protection, you keep the client, the customer inside your uh, perimeter. Uh, at the end of the day, when you have a, the threat of a bank run, I believe it's better uh, to have a, a very global relationship with the customer because uh, it put him at the, at the end of the day to earn money in our industry, you need to keep customers uh, more than five years and to give them one more than two or three products. You can have very clever people about uh, segmentation, uh, equipment and so on, but at the end of the day, Retail banking is about more than five years and more than two or three products. And that's where even against crisis like we had, uh, I think it's a good protection business model. Debbie, did you want to? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to reinforce everything you said. I'm going to brandish my <laughs> laurel wreath again. Because if you look at the individuals involved in those banking crises, you had exhibit A for the dominant chief executive, very little check and balance within the firm, and then absent supervision. I mean, SVB was screamingly obvious that it was weak. It was a business model that couldn't possibly stand up to any kind of market stress. Nothing happened. And so importance of supervision, the governance, S, S, um, Marlena. Having a, no, no, the, the accountability framework. Accountability. Yep. Super important. But also the supervisor that has to have the whole knowledge of the business model to be able to have a reasonable conversation mm -hmm. about vulnerabilities is beyond the ratios that Nicola was talking about and the capital requirements. So my laurel wreath again. <laughs> Glad to see it again. Can't come too many times. Um, so we're talking about the need to adapt as we move forward. Let's, let's move on to that. Discussions about adaptation are going on globally, like the Basel core principles we've talked about. What well, they've been mentioned. Kirsten, can you tell us a bit more about them and the conversations that you're involved in that are going on? Yeah, I'm not myself involved, but the Basel core principles for banking supervision, they are under review. And the core principles, they were, the uh, first time they were issued, I think it was 1997, and then they were re reviewed in uh, 2012. And now there has been another review after the crisis we have been through. And the whole thing with those Basel core principles is to make sure that uh, it's principles to make sure that uh, supervisors around the globe have a high standard that, that we are working more or less in the same uh, fashion. Uh, what I can see from the uh, revised now core principles is that there will be um, new focuses on uh, sustainable business models that has not been in there before. But uh, with what has happened, I mean, it's not rather clear that we need to make sure that banks have sustainable business models. Climate risk has not been covered in the, those core principles, so that will be another area. 
operational resilience is also important. I think it has been there, but now it's uh, more evident. And with operational resilience, it's about, of course, uh, cyber risk and uh, other I mean, risk in that area. But, and it is a growing importance that banks are also focusing, investing, and making sure that they have uh, experts and risk management procedures in place. And there was also a fourth area, and that is the exposures to the non-financial uh, um, sectors. That was also mentioned here in the first panel. But this is a little bit of a growing area and where we can see that uh, we need to have an increased focus, um, not necessarily banking supervisors, but there may be exposures from banks to the this uh, sector that is growing and then we need to maybe have a better grip and maybe we also need to understand better if there is a need for more regulation or supervision in that area. Nicola, thoughts on that? What more adaption regulation is needed? <laughs> of course, no, but if I may, uh, I think on climate we need more regulation and more clarity because uh, uh, we need more clearer deadlines and uh, I agree basically uh, what was said but uh, on climate we need a, a common rule for banks but also for all other actors and industries because at the end of the day if industries are not forced to decarbonize uh, it's not uh, up to the funding machine to, to find the solution uh, against uh, the, the technicians so that's where and I, I would say we need a global regulation on climate, much more ambitious, and with no delays and no too much transitions. Too many transitions. Mm -hmm. Jose Manuel, do you agree with what you're hearing? Absolutely. What's your take over yeah, there? I, mean, I, I would say that we need more regulation. I think what we need to do is we need to assess where are the potential areas of new risks that we need to watch for. And it's technology and sustainability, clearly the two brothers. I mean, we have the classical ones that will continue on the interest rates and all these areas, but the new risk potentially may come. Also, many opportunities. So this is not uh, to under underscore those opportunities, but since we're talking about supervisors, we're focused on risks. So it's mainly technology and sustainability. We talked of, of Ramad about technology, but I think sustainability is very important. I think that, you know, uh, I think we, we, I would like to get more regulation, but before, before we get to more regulation, we need to understand very well what we're regulating. So what we need to do is to do, to work more. I'm going to call it on experimentation. Maybe that's the wrong word. You know, but if we all try to figure out how to address this challenge, and we really put the foot into there, then we'll figure out the real good key levers that will put us into what we should be doing or what we should not be doing and then have the regulation. In the, in the meantime, I think we all need to, on, on, on the aspect of sustainability, I think we all need to be aware that we need to be doing more. And that should be the key message for the banks, they need to be doing more for the underlying companies, they need to be doing more in enhancing the, the, their data and their measurement. From our perspective, we need to be doing more in trying to get better at understanding how we can start putting limits on what's going well and what's got not going so well. Yes, please. Can I put a different angle on this? Sure. Maybe? I, in sustainability, I just think we need much better regulation because we have ended up with the regulated sector being cut out of any of the toxic, the really difficult abatement questions. And we've got the unregulated sector that can go all nil in there. And private equity firms are making a lot of money out of financing coal projects, for example. Mm. So we've created this dichotomy between the regulated sector and the unregulated sector by this taxonomy concept. And I think we're getting really perverse incentives here. And people like them are being judged on totally different basis to the private market operators. And so we're only creating opportunity for the unregulated sector to compete against them in a very, very unfair way. And that, that to me, just feels like a very dangerous place to be. We've created an arbitrage, basically. I, I would challenge that a little bit. If I Do challenge, if challenge away. I'm not sure what we mean by regulated versus unregulated. What's regulated mean in the, in the context of sustainability in the banking sector? The taxonomy is widely applied. It applies for asset, asset managers, it applies for investor base, it applies for a large amount of financing into the, into, the, into the overall economy. I would not say that there's a lot of banking specific taxonomy regulation that's really Putting in the, at least in the potential for right now, all we have is really some 
active, act, active action and indications on pillar two from the point of view of supervisors at this stage. But there's not really, there's not really any pillar one really significant regulation on sustainability aspects. I think it's the overall financial sector. But that's my point, Jose Manuel. The private equity sector right now can do as much as they want in the- But the private equity needs to get the money from some investors which need to comply with some taxonomy on that part of the investor base. So, oh, she, yeah. Thank you, I like a little, a little debate there. So <laughs> very quickly then, I want to open up to audience questions. I just wanted to ask you, Jose Manuel, the EBA framework, is that still working well? The ABA framework is work in process. I, of course, if it's the ABA framework, it's working well for the, by definition. But now, more seriously, <laughs> as I said before, it's work in progress. We have a roadmap in, which, in this area system in which we're working you know, to try to put forward some of the regulations. We are putting forward some pillar three disclosures. That's, I think, is working well originally. We're working on a, a stress test, uh, what's called the Fit for 55, to test the Fit for 55 strategy of the of the, of the European Commission and the European Union, you know, uh, that's jointly with the other supervisory authorities to try to build that going forward. And we're contributing to the regulatory agenda, the taxonomy, in the, trying to identify what's financial greenwashing. We'll provide some advice of the Commission on that. So it's an agenda that I think is working. But as I said before, my sense is we are doing a lot, but I wonder if it's still enough. And I think that's what everybody should be in, the, in that mindset from my perspective. Okay, thank you. Right, we'll open up to audience questions. I've got a couple coming through here online. So we've got a hand there already, let's take that. If you wanted to say who you are, which organization, and if you have someone that we, you want me to put it to, otherwise I'll open it up. Yeah, thank you. It's Alistair on Bank of America. So in the, the spirit of modern, hang on, I'll stand up then. In the spirit of modern supervision, so it's an options pricing question. Um, so you've, you've got a lot of options. You've accrued a lot of options. Uh, the right to add capital requirements, macroprudential rules, um, climate change, stress, um, supervisory add-ons for corporate governance, early interventions, <coughs> and as the Swiss experience, the right to bail in AT1, or the threat of bailing in TLAC bonds, which obviously was a large part of the collapse of Credit Suisse. So the market collectively tells you that we've written you those options, and they've been very expensive for us. So as Anna Bottin, uh, Reference before, um, her bank's facing an 18% cost of equity, which is a, a really difficult number for Europe because the European banking system can't make 18%. So how does a modern supervisor think about the cost of the options it's accrued to itself in the light of the evidence that the market's finding those expensive? Thank you. And who would you like that question to? Oh, everybody. Okay, who wants to take it? Who wants to take it first? <laughs> Okay, Kirsten, then I'll throw that to you. <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, this is, of course, an important question, and uh, so we have also uh, opened up with the, our market contact group to discuss with the market, and I think we understand very well their view. But as a supervisor, we need to make sure that we have a sound and prudent banking sector, that they are resilient, and that they can continue and support the European economy. And I think that is uh, the uh, goal, and of course, uh, we as supervisor, we have a responsibility not to overdo supervision, but the banks have also a huge responsibility here to make sure that they have sustainable business models and that they can support uh, the economy in a very good way. Thank you. I'll take one of the online ones and I'll come back to you. I've, the question is, what's the biggest change to European banking supervision you want to see 10 more years down the road? Um, Nicolas, do you want to take that first? Honestly, uh, I do not see, I, I, I told about uh, the, the main challenges, but uh, I think it's a bit difficult to, to, to go in 10 years time. Sorry for that. <laughs> That's fine, absolutely. <laughs> David, did you want to yeah. give your thoughts? I think I've got one, I'm, because Dominique is here. I, I feel the going concern, gone concern, supervision question is a big one for us to institutionally tackle. And the reason why I raise this is, A, in a crisis, you need these two to be joined up very quickly and have a common view. And it's not clear whether our structure at the moment makes that easy. The second thing is, back to Alistair's point, the, the carrot and the stick. You can make yourself a lot more resolvable as a financial institution 
if you make some choices about your operating model that have nothing to do with the capital and liquidity requirements. They have a little bit to do, but it's about the operating model. And I firmly believe that a bank that is very resolvable ought to get some credit from the supervisors for having gone through that transition and made themselves resolvable now. In fact, that happened in, in Switzerland, not, not obviously with Credit Suisse, but with others, mm -hmm. where there was a bit of a carrot and stick with respect to the options, there was a negative option as well, that if you made, your, if you made that choice, you got a benefit or a capital deduction, whatever that may be. And I think that would be a really powerful way of making our banks focus on the right things that really made a difference with respect to the option pricing that, that Alistair was, was alluding to. That's, that's a hard one. No, I mean, I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do. Huh? No? Yeah, please. No, just uh, very quickly. To me, it's obvious that uh, some of the so like uh, things that were left to be done from the previous session, I hope that get done over the next 10 years. You know, so like mm -hmm. making sure that we have uh, resilience, cross-border banking in the union, some of the issues about deepening the banking union. It, it has nothing to do with supervision mainly, or, but, but I hope the supervisor at least helps in that direction to help that grow and that, that will, f you know, become less of a conversation 10 years from now. Nicola. Uh, if I may, one compliment. Uh, I think that the main challenge for me would be the balance between the regulated entities and the non-regulated entities because uh, we, we have a problem of supervision of the non-regulated entities. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, if we want to fund the economy and to, to fund the transition uh, in the right way, I very much prefer to go through the regulated entities and the banks rather than having uh, the kind of uh, uh, discrepancies that we have today. So at certain stage, we should think about real businesses and not institutions only. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hand over there, lady in the black jumper. Good evening, and um, thank you for taking my question. Francesca Tamma, Banco BPM Italy. I've got a question about the climate risk uh, topic, which is indeed very important. And, and as a an European citizen, I really appreciate what uh, everything you're doing, both as the uh, EBA and the ECB for this topic. But I've got a, a big uh, doubt, which is, we have got to say in Italy, which is parlare a nuora perché suocera intenda which can be loosely translated as uh, uh, talking to the daughter-in-law in order to make the mother-in-law understand. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the question. Are we really sure that we are addressing the right uh, addressee with all this uh, supervisor pressure? There's anything we can do in order to address better governments, which should be the intended recipient of these sort of challenges. Who wants to take that? Jose Manuel, Justin? Well, yeah. I, I'll be very brief. I, I think, I don't know exactly what your analogy is pointing to, but if you're suggesting that we should do climate policy through banking supervision, I'm always reluctant to that. No, I think that banking supervision and banking uh, should do well what is that, which is that there's an underlying risk that we think is there, that is at present, that, needs to, that is likely to materialize, and we need to make sure that the financial sector is properly addressing those risks and is well prepared to finance the economy to wherever it's going. So if, if what you meant is that we're trying to do climate policy through banking supervision, I hope we're not, because that would be the wrong task. Yeah, climate and environmental risk is, of course, very important. And that's why we have been working on this for at least uh, three years now. But I mean, w our aim is to make sure that bank can uh, risk manage uh, climate and environmental risk in the same way as they are doing with all other risks they have uh, in their balance sheet. So we can just work within our mandate. And this is, I mean, we think it is, of course, very important, but governments need to also work on their side, of yeah. course. Thank you. Yeah, question over there. Is that working? Yeah, uh, Tom McAleese from a and again. Um, going concern to gone concern seems to be getting a lot quicker. Uh, what we've seen from SVB and Credit Suisse and the speed that deposits ran out of those banks. What are the regulators thinking about that? Because we've never seen uninsureds 
moving out of SPV very quickly, the same in Credit Suisse, and then the, 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 uh, the digital money moving so quickly as well. That's a big concern because you're looking at a bank like Credit Suisse, for instance, profitable bank, was, had decent capital, decent liquidity, big issue was business model, as you say, right? They came out, they had three good businesses, Swiss Bank, Asset Management Bank, and Wealth Management Bank. They had one very bad bank, the investment bank. The company came out with a revised strategy at the end of August and said, we're keeping the investment bank, we're reducing it by 40%, disaster. But we're still limping along. And then the deposits just started to move. That's scary because you've got a bank that's actually limping along in a going concern situation and then can fall off the track very quickly. So what's your, what's your question? What's your view on this deposit moving? Oh, deposit moving. OK, that's, Marlene. That's yeah. yeah. Marlene, do you want to take that? So, uh, as, as I mentioned, so I think the, the, the focus on liquid, liquidity is, is, uh, is really instrumental. I mean, we've seen in Credit Suisse in one quarter, outflows of 160 billion so and uh, this is really massive and we also saw that Credit Suisse was among the G-SIPs, the, the, the most liquid G-SIP just before this happened. So uh, I think this, this tells us already a lot about the, the, the speed uh, of the outflows. And I think the speed is uh, something we really need to uh, look into. Uh, one way to, uh, the, the obvious way uh, to, to counterbalance that is a, a pillar two. Uh, in the case of Credit Suisse, we installed the pillar two uh, two years in advance. So we installed it, we, we lifted it uh, already in the summer of 2020. So that was one of the reasons why uh, uh, the liquidity ratio was so high right before uh, uh, these uh, October events. But after that, I think pillar two can only take you uh, so far. So after that, there is clearly also a, a, a role for the lender of last resort. So then we need to look into uh, the, the, the collateral that is related uh, uh, to the, 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 the facilities there. So I think that, that's definitely something we need to look into. And there is no kind of clear and obvious answer uh, here, here and now, uh, other than uh, we need to develop the uh, first those uh, monitoring systems that we have currently in place and also uh, need to make uh, sure that uh, we have aside from pillar two also other measures uh, to address these these particular these particular issues thank you Nicolas did you want to add to that yeah uh, on liquidity I'm both modest and obsessed uh, it can happen and you, you, you should be absolutely obsessed into your balance of liquidity, if I may. At the very early stage, the, your problem is transforming your customers into partners and not players against the bank. And that's where transparency, uh, the, 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 the intensity of relationship, the different fields of uh, businesses, uh, asset management, uh, traditional bank, insurance, and so on, it's key because at the end of the day, if you have a question on confidence, on the trust your customers are uh, putting into the bank, it's lost. It's already lost. So the obsession of service, and that's where digitalization could be a danger because if you bet too much on digitalization without advice, the duty of advice, without somebody uh, enhancing the relationship, you create the situation where your customers become commodities. And in this case, that's real and present danger. And you're beyond figures from my point of view on that, because this is the early stage and that's really where you can act as responsible of a bank. Okay. Naomi, can I just add? Yes, you can. The trust is also between the tripartites, the supervisor, the GON concern, and the ministries of finance. And their ability to move in sync and quickly and have a very clear communication with the market, super, super important, right? So the trust works both ways, both with clients as well as with the relevant authorities. Okay, I've seen nodding in response. We are nearly at time. I want to ask you very quickly, all of you, just before we finish, my question to each of you in turn is, how positive are you about the future of European banking supervision? And if you could make one wish for its evolution, what would it be? We'll start with you, Nicola, and we'll go around that way. One, what? <laughs> I am optimistic about the European banking 
industry and supervision, because for me, it's really linked. And uh, I would hope for some simplification on details. And uh, let's focus on the essentials. Thank you. Also optimistic, Naomi. One point I've already raised, which is the join up of gone concern and going concern. And then the second is the Shrep process, which I, I think can be a really, really powerful tool. And the supervisors will continue to invest in that to make it very different from a compliance-driven thing. So forward-looking, business model-centric Shrep process. So I would like to broaden your question. I mean, I hope that the banking union will come into force so that we have all three pillars there. I think Europe really needs a strong banking union and banking supervision is, of course, part of that. But there will be a number of challenges here in the coming years. So we need banks and we need good financial markets in order to finance all the investments that we will see. Thank you. Uh, very similar to Kristen. You know, I think that the experience of the last 10 years has shown that this is going the right direction. Let's make sure it's filling up. Let's make sure that we can get the glass to be completely full. And for me as a Swiss, I don't have a, a wish, but I have a big yeah. thank you uh, for the uh, cooperation uh, with all the uh, European institutions and particularly also to, to Andrea and particularly also uh, during this year. So this is much appreciated and rest assured that we do everything to also further foster and, and increase these, uh, these cooperation among the, the, the European institutions. Well, nice to end on a note of optimism, shared optimism. So would you join me in thanking our wonderful panellists for such an enlightening and wonderful conversation? Thank you. Very nice. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just, to, just keep you there for a second? Uh, just to thank you for a very lively discussion as well. So we had some two, two very good panel discussions today already and, of course, a very great conversation earlier. Um, just to conclude the first half of the conference uh, today. So we will resume tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock with a keynote speech uh, by Michael Barr, the Vice Chair for Supervision of the Federal Reserve. Uh, just a quick reminder, before you leave the building, please hand back your ECB badge. You have you, you over, uh, received two badges. You can keep at the welcome desk where you came in. Um, but you can keep your conference badge, of course, until tomorrow. So have a good evening, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow.